Oh my god. Welcome back to the Sabbath at midnight. We have a popular guest from our last show. The Netflix look like clowns. Paul Stobbs from the UK. And tonight we have another really great show. We're going to discuss the hat man and maybe get into some other things like gestures and who knows, maybe the Nephilim. And it's always good to have Paul back. My brother from across the pond. Paul, how's it going, man? Good to have you back. Uh, it's going well. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, this topic tonight is really, really interesting. Um, uh, from the hat man perspective, um, I, I was just wondering, um, one of, one of my first uh, uh, things that come to mind is yourself as a researcher, did you ever experience this entity? Uh, yes. Um, to be honest, it was one of the earliest you known memories I have of like a major spiritual experience with the other world and like demonic entities. It was kind of my, uh, one of my wake up calls, to be honest. Um, it happened maybe try to think back now um, when I published the video, but I think it was roughly probably around 2000, either 2011 or 2013, between that time in my life, um, about a decade ago, just more. I had this um, this dream, um, though it felt like more real than anything I've ever experienced in my entire life, to be honest. But um, I had this bizarre this bizarre encounter with this, this thing called the Hatman. Now, just to preface this i i had never heard of this thing before i knew nothing about it okay it was um i had barely i just started to dip my toes into the supernatural concepts and spirituality and um, conspiracy by this point i wasn't really like in a, in a, a particular well-versed researcher by that point of of much you know um but i, I was I said, okay, so let, let's let's that being said that I didn't know anything about really the demonic realm by this point. So when this happened to me, it was really random. Um, I'll just tell you the story. So um, I, I'm asleep, and um, there's a video on my channel which documents all of this with visuals and sounds because it's one of those dreams where you just have to write it all down as soon as you wake up. And I made a video out of it, but um, it basically involves me walking through a park, um, and I'm walking through this 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 rolling hill park down a path. There are people around me um, picnicking, throwing frisbees, walking the dog, laughing and playing, having a good time. Um, and I, I'm walking towards this old, um, this old big metal Victorian iron, uh, wrought iron gate with these beautiful um, floral iron patterns kind of weaved into it. It's this giant gate and this big uh, brick archway which the gates were nested between. And then there was like um, hedges on either side of the... Uh, the gates there they weren't particularly tall hedges they were about waist high but that's that's what happened and behind this gate i could see there was this kind of this hedge maze you know like um like you get at maybe like uh, corn fairs or things like that or in um, like old parks um like the one in the shining for example that that hedge maze they had there but um just a lot shorter in height basically um so i could see this hedge maze but as i'm walking towards this gate i noticed um there are people drinking tea at these old Victorian cast raw iron chairs, you know, and these little tables. And they're having like a, a, a quintessential British tea party type thing. You know what I mean? This is old, old Victorian style. It was bizarre. And I was, I was walking towards these people and I realized uh, I recognized these people. And there were some of my older dead relatives, um, like my great aunties and things like this, you know. Um, I think even my granddad was there on my mum's side, who I never met. I only had photographs of, you know, it was very strange. But it was basically just all my dead relatives were drinking tea outside of this this gateway. And I'm walking up towards them and they're kind of all happy to see me. They're like, oh, join us, Paul. Come, come. It's so great to see you. You know what I mean? Let's catch up, this type of thing. And I'm kind of like just going with it. I, I, don't, I don't think I'm dreaming by this point. You know, I'm, I'm just going with it as though it's a perfectly normal thing to be seeing. Um, and I sit down with them and, um, you know, I'm laughing and joking with them and I drink the tea um, that they offer me. And not long after that, suddenly my phone starts to ring in my pocket. So I, I take out this old, like, really old flip phone, like a Motorola Razor or something, you know, like a, 
a really old flip phone of the day. <laughs> you know? We don't have flip. When I'm having this dream, flip phones are really are a thing of the past by this point. But this is what I've got. Um, and it's that old Nokia theme tune, that kind of da 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 type noise. And you know, I, I just answer the phone while I'm talking away. And, you know, I'm like, hello. And this voice says to me, don't think I've forgotten about our previous conversation. I'm coming for you now. And suddenly the atmosphere changes, you know, um, all the color just gets sapped out of this beautiful um, park I was in. It's dark, it's gray, clouds are looming type of thing. Um, the laughter's stopped. I'm alone. There's no one else here now. Everyone's disappeared. And I have this dreaded feeling and realization that um, I, I'd heard this voice before and I knew who it was, you know, um, and I owed it something. And then my, just as quickly while I'm having this moment, I, I remember in this dream, another dream. Okay, so we're getting Inception now. It's really, it was a really bizarre experience, but suddenly I'm taken back and I'm in, I'm at this place, I'm in this place, okay, and I can only describe it as like a, a, a music festival that's well within a few days into the festival. So nothing's fresh anymore. All the ground is just pounded into mud from, you know, days of partying and footfall from this festival. And there's like wooden structures everywhere and stages set up and lights flashing everywhere. People screaming and wailing and dancing all around. You know, and I'm kind of like moving through the, this layered, strange festival of, of sorts at night time. And then I'm on stage at this festival. And there's, as far as the eye can see, just people screaming, you know, and I think about it now in retrospect, it's kind of like a festival itself, the sound of a festival, you know, when you really hear it roaring and screaming if you closed your eyes, I imagine that's probably actually what hell would sound like, you know, with all this screaming and wailing type of thing. So I don't know where I was exactly, but I remembered I had this dream months ago where I was at this festival on this stage, okay? And I was on the stage and I don't remember what happened exactly. But then I come back into the other dream where I'm at this garden, where I'm, I'm on the phone to this voice, this evil, horrible sounding, sinister voice. And I kind of remember I met this guy at that festival and I owe him something and I don't know what it is, but I owe this guy something and he's coming now to collect type of thing. I just knew, I just knew in that moment. Um, and then just as suddenly as I have this vision and I realize, you know, this moment, I look to the horizon of this park I'm in and coming over it is this character, this, this, this silhouette of this, this person. And he's, he's wearing a long purplish dark trench coat. He has multicolored ribbons just flailing off of him in all directions, kind of flying behind him and just everywhere. Multicolored ribbons of all shapes and patterns and ragged, straight, neat, shiny, multicolored patterned, um, kind of like Morris dances with the maypole ribbons, you know, something like that. Wearing this long purple trench coat, and he had this hat on, this this fedora shaped top hat style thing, wide rimmed. His face was hidden behind the shadows of it, but I could see these glowing eyes, these glowing yellow golden eyes underneath. And he had a cane. And he was kind of just hobbling towards me from this distance, and I could see him. And I knew I do not want this thing to get anywhere near me. So I just turn around and I try to run into the hedge maze. I open, trying to open the gates and get into the maze. Um... But the, it's typical when, you know, when you're in fear and shock in a dream and you try and run, suddenly you can't run anymore and the air feels like jelly and it's thick and like, like molasses and you're trying to just push through, you know, like swim through the air type of thing. Um, but I do move slowly and I'm getting through this hedge maze and I'm like, I'm not going to have any time to figure this out, this maze. So I just start hopping over the hedges to get to the other side. <laughs> so I'm hopping over these hedge maze. It's very waist high hedge maze you know it's kind of pointless maze to be honest um and i get to the side and sort of there's a similar archway metal gate at the opposite side you know and i can see the civilization through it like a city of some kind you know like so i'm trying to get to it basically so i can get away 
And I do, I get through to the other side. I'm not looking back, but I know he's there. I feel it, you know, I feel this eyes piercing into the back of my body type of feeling. Um, and I get through to the side, and I'm on a city road, and as I look up in the skyscrapers in front of me, you know what I mean? Um, and I run specifically to the right, and I just go, I just go as far as I can, and then before I know it, the road in front of me, the whole world in front of me just peels away, and I'm kind of stood at the edge of a crumbled world, you know, this, the road has stopped, there's metal pipes sticking out that drop beneath me, you know, where the pipes would have been type of thing just gone it's removed and there's kind of like a hanging metal sign hanging over to the left of me from the buildings that were there originally you know are now just torn away and it's just a dark void in front of me of brown golden misty disgusting color in front of me it's it's not a natural color it's it's like a just the color of death and misery basically is, is how i would describe it and i'm here and i realize i can't run any further there's nothing i can do i'm this is it this is the end, you know, and I turned around and he was there. And all I could think to do in that moment was wrench my eyes open. And with a massive struggle, writhing and basically screaming and covered in sweat, I, I woke up, luckily. But it was a struggle to tear myself away from it. And, and in that moment, you know, when he was there in front of me, I, I literally I, I felt like this is it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to die this is the end for me, you know, this is, this is it now, this is, and I was kind of coming to an acceptance of that <laughs> in a way, there's nowhere left to run, you know, Absolutely. Um, but I, I, I kind of, I don't know, something deep down, I knew this isn't real, this is a dream, this is a dream, I can wake up, I can wake up, and I did, I managed to wrench my eyes open with great difficulty, you know, it's like something was forcing me to stay asleep, and I was fighting against it, basically, um, and then I woke up and, you know, immediately after that event, I was shook up. I didn't sleep that the rest of that night. You know, I, I, um, I was oh, just, my I, mind I, was, I, my mind was reeling. Like, what was this? What was this thing? You know, and how, how the hell did it manage to follow me through dreams? This character, you know, and like I, I had met this thing at a, in a previous dream months ago and it's, no, it, really? and it's come after me in this new dream. You know, it, it. I met this character in a dream where I was at a festival maybe like months prior and it's called me up in a new dream to tell me it's coming to collect whatever deal I made with it. It's coming to, it's my time to fulfill the end of the bargain or something. <laughs> so it feels like I had made a deal with this thing in a previous dream for something. And I don't know what it was. I have no recollection or memory of that particular deal I made. But this thing clearly remembered, you know, and... Uh, it, since then, you know, that day, I've I've ever wondered just what dreams truly are, and um, how important it is to to not uh, eat and drink anything in a dream if it's offered to you. I'm learning things like this, you know, because it's kind of opening yourself up or taking offerings from entities which are probably not really my dead relatives, you know. And the the whole my life has never been really the same since. You know, I I looked into the Hat Man, just Google searching the Hat Man, and um, I found an author called Heidi Hollis. Okay. Um, and Heidi Hollis has written a book called The Hat Man, you know, a, a, a compilation of evil encounters with this entity. And it's just a book full of people's testimonies encountering this being. And I, here I am, a brand new person by this point, who's also just had a similar brush with this shadowy entity um and like i said i had no prior knowledge of this thing prior to having this dream you know i had this is it was the first for me and then to realize that people from all over the earth have had the same encounter suddenly made me realize this is this is probably more than just a dream you know this was actually a lot more serious and from hat man to shadow people to demonology to you know the rest of it coming to Christ, learning about the Nephilim and all that type of thing. Here I am like a decade later and, you know, and saved by the blood of Jesus basically to protect myself from these things in the future, you know, but um, from that day on, it was my path forward to being a full believer in all the spiritual warfare stuff. You know, it was a big moment for me, but uh, I would not wish on my worst enemy to encounter this thing. And that's probably where I'll leave that story for now. It's, um, Just listening to you, just you know, discuss your your dream. 
I was thinking back to a time where my dad, now long past, I was just about to say that. Go ahead, st- tell. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, it's, a, it's a hat man story, right? He has a hat man story. Oh yeah, this is a creepy one, man. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what he was doing one night. He was out in a in a place called El Centro, California, and he was coming back from someplace. I don't remember that too many years ago, but. Is something was was uh, following him. He says a very tall guy with a trench coat, and he had a yeah. top hat. And my dad started yelling at him. I think he started throwing rocks at him. And he, my dad started running, and he says that this thing started running. And he says inside the cloak, inside the trench, it was all red. But but he didn't reveal that to the end, like a, like a bat. He opened it up. And- yeah, it was, it was really creepy. It was really creepy. And and my my uncle. Years, years later, had the same experience out in a, in a city called Indio, California. And he was, uh, I guess he, he got home and the story is that he told my, my grandmother what had happened and they gave him sugar water back then, you know, for, for shock. Mm. But he described basically the same thing, you know, a long trench coat with the top hat and inside the trench coat or the cloak, it was, it was all red. Well, let's not forget that it also didn't have a face. There was no face there. Like when, when my grandfather explained the story to me, there was no face. It was just a black figure. No eyes, no nose, no nothing. So wait, what, you know, I, I don't know what causes people to have these dreams or experience a hat man. I mean, I, I've seen, you know, shadow, shadow people and, I was reading a, an article by, um, let's see, her name is, there's an article in Psychology Today. Um, it says that um, some people may consider the hat man to be, you know, obviously a, a form of a shadow person. And this article in Psychology Today, uh, paranormal expert Rosemary Allen Gulley, she says the, the shadow people could potentially wear hats and cows to cover up imperfect heads like maybe something um i don't know elongated head or something that people would call extraterrestrial mm. uh, so it's it, there's a lot of you know different things about this you know the, the sleep paralysis phenomenon yeah uh, people experience the the hat man um so the list goes on and on and on Sure. And, um, I could give you a, I give you like a rundown of what I've basically discovered over the years to try and and then see if you guys have any counter information to it. To be honest, because like I said, the interpretations of just exactly what we're dealing with here vary dramatically, um, and encounters aren't always identical necessarily, but the underlying themes are the same. That it's a person with a trench coat and a hat that seems to be a leader of some kind of of these shadow entities that seems to be he's like the, as far as shadow entities go he's like the top dog if you get what i mean that seems to be the common theme running throughout it um, yeah i think the yeah go on. i think the the first uh, uh paralysis was in um sea paralysis was in 1664 it was the uh incubus or the nightmare yeah uh and uh i i guess you know they, they uh Put that one and one together, you know, explaining that sea paralysis was some form of black magic or mythical monsters, demons, and the Egyptians believed uh, that the jinn genie was behind sleep paralysis, and the indigenous people of South Africa believed it was caused by the Tokoshi. Hope I'm saying that right, a dwarf-like water spirit, and the Turkish believed the Karabashan spirit-like creatures were behind the phenomenon. I, I don't know. I'm just reading this article. Yeah. But, I mean, what do you? Yeah, go ahead and give yeah, us your yeah, yeah, research. Uh, right, well, f- first of all, like you said, there are these encounters people have during sleep paralysis. The majority of the time is where they witness things like shadow people. But I don't. I know it's not confined strictly just to people who are under sleep paralysis. Um, people can see them at any moment, at any time. Um, the general shape of these entities is often humanoid, but not necessarily human. Um so you know, personally, just cutting to the chase, I I think they are the Nephilim entities, what we call demons on the other side of the veil, um, the same entities people see on DMT in these colourful fractal jester-like forms. Um, my theory as to why they are shadowed, in a sense, I think it's uh, it's to do with perception. Um, it's not necessarily that 
um, they look like shadows realistically. I think they look incredibly psychedelic and like clowns, personally. You already know what my opinion on this is. Um, but I do think it depends on the individual's ability to perceive that other realm. Okay, and I do believe the most people who encounter these entities have in some way experienced some kind of trauma. Um, and it's this initial trauma that kickstarts their ability to see these entities. It's almost as though trauma in some way does something to a human's mind and perception, which makes them more perceptible to be, to be able to visualize the spiritual realm, we'll call it, you know, the fractal realm in some way. And it's the first step demons take in to get into somebody is to traumatize them and um, get them into that state of fear, that state of trauma. And it does seem like a, a surefire way of, of allowing the demons to get a foothold on an individual. Um, so I, this this seems to be the common link I've I've seen. Um, in terms of my own trauma, why I saw the hat man, I realized this was during a time where I was heavily addicted to cannabis and psychedelic use. You know, uh, my veil was thin, basically, and my ability to for these beings to interact with me was was probably more um, capable than let's say somebody who hadn't opened up any of these gateways. That's sort of probably another way to describe it. Um, but if you haven't done it through self-inflicted forms, then uh, generational trauma is another great way for demons to kind of get a foothold into an individual. Now, I think the level in which you are traumatized or have messed with your perceptions, um, whether it's, like I said, lit, um, on purpose or by accident, is the level in which you'll be able to see the entity manifest in reality. Now, other people in the same room may not be able to see what you can see, but that doesn't mean it's any less real from what you can actually perceive. I think what you perceive, like I said, if your veil is still relatively thick, but it's just been pierced, you'll see a projection of some kind of the form of the demon, but it'll look shadowy and wispy and smoky, not, not quite there, not quite clear. And I do think the more you get traumatized or the more you, you weaken your veil by accident or on purpose, the stronger that vision will become and the less shadowy they'll become and a lot more psychedelic they'll become, a lot more colourful, a lot more like the true serpentine-like, multicoloured, patterned, jester-like, wide-grinned form. Um, I just, like I said, I think the shadow entities are like the first initial precursor to the to the ultimate form. Um, it's, it's just what you can vaguely perceive in the moment, but um, the more they can rattle you, uh, right. I think the, the clearer they'll become. It seems to be the way. Like I said, um, it wasn't a shadow entity for me. He was in full colour when he came to me. And that's hardly surprising because for me, I, I'd already been to the DMT realm a few times and I've been taking acid every other weekend, you know, and taking mushrooms and the rest of it. I was on MDMA every weekend, you know. I was wide open. Yeah, you're, pulling, you're pulling a Johnny Depp there, man. It, well, yeah, that, that was my life at the time. You know, I was a typical, stereotypical art student in university. So I, it's hardly surprising, you know. Um but that's what I think it is. But I think, you know, people who have never even like considered spiritual stuff and just pretty, you know, the average Joe who does a nine to five and doesn't, has a family, doesn't really partake in anything wild. You know, they, they tend to, like I said, see shadow people. Um, maybe, maybe they've had a bad experience or something terrible's happened. Maybe the death of a family member or something. And it's just kind of jump starts their ability to start having these entities mess with them. If you get what I mean. Um, and like I said, they, they tend to encounter shadow people is what I've noticed. That's just my own observations. Um, now, in terms of the hierarchy of what these things are, like I said, I do believe the demonic realm has a hierarchy, just like um, we do, you know, just like a military does. They have generals, lieutenants and grunts at the bottom, and you know, and they have uh, majors and, and leaders. And I think the hat man is a high ranking entity, a very high ranking entity. Is it the devil? No, I don't think so. I think there are many hat men. Um, and I also understand as we'll get into later and we'll expand upon, um, shamans who, um, commune with the spirit realm regularly and channel entities, you'll find that a common motif for a lot of them is a hat and in particular, a tall wide brimmed hat. Um, right. and I do think, you know, as ancestor worship worshipers understand, you dress like the thing to channel the thing. Um, so, you know, you go and if you want power, you go to the top, <laughs> you know, you don't ask the lowly, the lowly demons and uh, you go, you go talk to the boss type of thing. Uh, so uh, again, uh, that's my initial interpretation of why shadows. 
um what's your what do you think of that you know what's your opinion i think shadows are definitely um disembodied spirits of of you know more than likely the the nephilim the nephilim for me are all shapes and forms and maybe there's obviously there are giants and probably some other chimera type of creatures that didn't have the spirit of god breathed into them it was just another spirit mm-hmm. uh and uh yeah i'm along those lines i, I think these uh, these entities are able to come into our reality how they do it I, that's still a question I, I don't think anyone really knows that answer but it seems they're able to like you mentioned you know some some of them are formed of a mist some become solid like if, for example what my dad saw my uncle saw they seem solid and they seem you know not misty not imperfect not you know like a, a smoke cloud coming at you i mean these things were you can see it i mean mm. you couldn't see the face but you can see the outline of the body it wasn't all just it distorted it was you know a perfect figure like a man coming at you and um what from from my experiences you know seeing uh these these figures and um you know from uh from dark entities standing in the hallway to headless ones i mean i don't know paul i mean this the longer we the more episodes we go through the stranger things get but i think we're you know by pulling these threads we're getting a, a clearer understanding that i i believe that when when people get into uh these um psychedelics and drugs like for example um many out there know of aaron Rodgers. he was a quarterback of the green bay packers now the new york jets i read an article in in uh i think it was 2020 or 2019 he took a trip i think it was to peru and he took ayahuasca hmm. and uh and I, I believe his the article says his girlfriend was some kind of witch and um since that time uh he's been experiencing seeing the the hat man with the dead rabbit in his hand or a blade mm. or something you know, along those lines yeah so i mean i don't know what the what the ramifications are with the imagery of a of a blade in the hand or a dead rabbit it sounds like the magicians how they pull the rabbits out of the top hat so it sounds like a magician type of thing yeah is oh, there is there is and like i said i can exp- I'll expand on this as we go on um i've got a lot of a lot of stuff to do with the clowns to link to all the, this Hatman character. And yeah, I was actually literally just thinking about magicians myself an hour ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, just like dead rabbit, the, you know, the hat, like it sounds like magician stuff too. Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, uh, um, as I was saying, you know, there are examples in movies, people like me to reference like popular culture where the, there are these entities that manifest more and more as the film progresses, as the, the individual or the protagonist gets more and more scared that seems to be the general theme um that runs through it and it's um let me see i wrote it down i wrote it down in my book here as an example um yeah so the mind flayer from stranger things is a good example that's a wispy smoky entity in the upside down like a spider like tornado looking smoke monster um, and it obviously it preys on it. Well, it gets more powerful and the ability to come into this world through mystical um, forms. But it it it, it preys on the, the fear of people, you know, um, to get to pierce its way into our realm. Um, Pennywise the clown from Stephen King's It is a quintessential fear feeding ghoul. You know, um, it can manifest more and more physically into someone's life, and um, the more scared it can get its victim. That's basically how it works. So its its role is to become the victim's worst fear. And um, the more fear it has, the more powerful it becomes. The the more ability it has to manifest into the physical world. Therefore, get gaining the ability to physically eat children. That's kind of its end goal. But its game is fear first to gain the power. Um, Freddy Krueger is another great example. Nightmare on Elm Street. You know, it feeds on the fear of people in, within their dreams. And Freddy Krueger is actually a hat man. He wears his own fedora hat. Um, and he is a dream feeder of fear. You know, um, his key role is to generate fear. Um, it's it's a common theme. It's a trope in movies, you know. And obviously, I think it's a, a case of art mimicking life and reality. Um, they know what they're talking about, the people who made these films. Um, uh, you no, know, in terms of shadow entities, you know, we have... Um, 
a Dementor from Harry Potter. And when someone encounters a Dementor, it's literally, they literally have their soul sucked from their body and they're usually paralyzed with fear. Um, they have the Nazgul's of Tolkien's Lord of the Ring universe, the black cloak shadowy figures, you know, who are chasing the hobbits at the beginning. And they ride uh, dragons, funnily enough. <laughs> um, so a link there to the Serpentine uh, bloodline, you know, and where these the origins of these things come from. Um, yeah, so it's referenced quite a lot in media. Um, so I'll say that about the shadow people and the entities alone. But I, I do settle myself on, you know, the only things in this realm are the many forms of ex-humans who turn themselves into corrupted beings and the Nephilim themselves. Um, and they came in all shapes and sizes. You know, think of fairy folk, gnomes, elves, trolls, goblins, centaurs, um, I don't know, phoenixes, all the corrupted animals as well, all the messed up creatures, you know, and not just giants. It's not just simply just giants. And um, they all kind of ended up very psychedelic and strange in form and nature. I mean, another famous one is the old hag from the past. That's like some uh, some demented hobbit-like dwarf woman um, with elvish ears and, you know, crooked bony fingers who kind of sits on the chest of its victims and stops them from being able to breathe and keeps them paralyzed during sleep, you know. Um, and I think that the end, the only way a demon can physically interact with our realm currently is to first generate fear. The more fear it can generate in its individual target, the stronger it can seem to manifest. It's a huge process because um, like they don't have physical bodies anymore. But what they can do is manifest enough to physically affect an individual by making them scared. Um, and I don't know to what extent that can make them manifest into reality like the movies do. I don't know if that's just for the movies only or for its reality. But I've heard stories of people having physical issues from it, you know, being physically attacked by monsters in the physical world um so yeah i don't i don't know it's it's, it's a tough one um in terms of his, history of of the hat man um and obviously the psychedelic realm and one thing I, I think i'll start with is to say um i believe the nephilim look like clowns and i think everything to do with clown culture including the circus in the west was invented by freemasonry as a way for them to create a way of dressing like demons in order to venerate demons in the public without the public realizing so in the same way you know um, tribes all around the world venerate their ancestor spirits they call them which are the nephilim basically uh, they dre they dress like them in their rituals you know to channel them and to venerate them and to um, bring them into the physical world through their bodies basically and now they all dress like something like a clown, like a psychedelic, colourful monster. Uh, serpentine in nature and tall and psychedelic and covered in ribbons and frills and, you know, these, these monstrous clown-like creatures. Now, they know what they're doing when they do it. And I think um, when the Freemasons invented the visage of a clown, they also knew what they were doing. You know, and the circus itself is, is embedded with uh, fractal realm symbology. So circuses, which were, as we first knew them, were actually um, equestrian horse shows in Britain. There, were, there was a ring which someone would ride a horse around in a circle and do backflips off of horses and jump from one horse to another and ride two horses at once while stood on, you know what I mean, just do tricks on horses. And that's, that's the proto-circus. Around the similar time, um, we had clowning in theatre and pantomimes kind of becoming highly popular through uh, Joseph Grimaldi. Um, it says it's all 1800s, early 18... Um, sorry, late 1800s, early 1900s period. Um, so there was this 100-year period from Grimaldi to then where the circus kind of became a big deal. The clown became a big deal and it was kind of co-opted by Freemasonry. They liked the image and they really, really rolled with it and made it more and more Nephilim-esque as time went on and incorporated it into these epic shows we called circuses around America. So uh, think of uh, Barnum and Bailey and the Ringling Bros. Every last one of them was a Freemason and they were the first orig original circuses in America, you know, and it was America that kind of popularized the circus as we know it. That's its original form. Um, with the clowns and the rings and the, the the ringmaster who wears the hat, you know, and, and orchestrates the circus. Um, all of that is a Freemason uh, ritual on a grand scale. And the and uh, it's in my book, actually. I've, I've got And this is referenced from another book, which is about the occult of Western art. Um, 
and it ba basically says, you know, uh, Freemasons created this this show, you know, these from these circuses, and they became a combined circus, and they put on this giant show, which was about um, King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, um, and every single aspect of this traveling show at the time was produced through Freemason affiliates. So all the costumes were produced by a company, which doesn't exist anymore. But it was during that time it was hired to create all the regalia and costumes for traditional Freemason rituals within lodges. And they made all the costumes for this um, for this show because it wasn't difficult for them to make these costumes because these are the same costumes Freemasons wear in their own rituals within lodges. Do you know what I mean? So they already kind of had them on hand. Um, so these these Freemasons, you know, worship are just a continuation of these serpent cults, antediluvian, post-diluvian serpent worship cults. And they believe they are the keepers of the seven sacred science and the knowledge, and they use that knowledge for power and gain and to further the agendas of demons they work for. And um, what they manage to do is basically, without people realizing it, is create a huge Freemasonic ritual on a grand scale in which the public pay to come and see. And it's kind of the, the more attention it gets, the more powerful the ritual is. Uh, so these circuses in, in their original form were literally Freemasonic, satanic summoning rituals. <laughs> and uh, the cast were dressed like demons, you know, <laughs> like clowns, just like an ancestor worshipping cult would do. They would dance around their own fire circle you know, making noise and moving their feet and swaying to drums, you know, um, to, in order to invocate and bring the demons to our realm. Well, that's exactly what the clowns were doing and the acrobats were doing in the psychedelic shiny clothing, the serpent skin clothes, you know, and the, the demon garb, which is a clown garb. You know, they may have been acting silly to try and hide their intentions, but um, the effects are the same thing as what these ancestor cults do. So on a mass scale, you know, these demons were being summoned, and who's in the centre of the ring summoning the demons? Well, it's the Hat Man, it's the Ringmaster. Now, the Ringmaster could be could be a subtle reference, first of all, to King Solomon, who did um, use a ring gifted to him by God to subdue the demons, um, and he also used those demons to build his temple. Um, Solomon is a huge character in Freemasonry; they love the guy. Um, they have done everything they can to, during this time period in the 1800s to rebuild Solomon's temple under many different forms and guises. This was pre-Depression era, pre-Collapse era, so there was a lot of money going about and the Freemasons were pretty haughty about it. Um, and they were building odes to Solomon's temple left, right and centre all over America at this time. So Solomon's a big deal, you know, and he is the original ringmaster. You know, the master of the ring, the lord of the ring, who subdued the demons under his will. Um, but not only that, within the Freemason halls, within these rituals, the worshipful grand master, so the head of the lodge, is the only one permitted to wear a black top hat. No one else is allowed to wear one. And that is a symbol of his authority and power within the lodge. Um, so the ringmaster of the circus is the Grand Master of the ritual within the Freemason Halls. It's the same character, just manifested and reflected into this circus allegory. Um, so what the circus is, is something for the public to see and not realise they're watching a ritual. You know, it's just a bit of fun for the family. That's as far as they need the profane masses to see it. But the people who are in the know, the initiated, they know that they're going to see a ritual on a grand scale. A summoning, demon summoning ritual. And our circuses in this day and age, they're dying out. They're not as popular yeah. as they used to be. It's not what it used to be anymore. And also they've kind of changed with time and they're a bit more toned down now. The Freemason influence has kind of dissipated out of it. And now we have like this empty shell of its original potent form, you know, when it was first initially done. And I think the true circus now, the true uh, place of the clowns, you know, and the true summoning rituals have been moved over to media and film and movies. You know, it's and um, I'd say the, the the last grand circus that exists in the world, which still does this type of thing to the level of summoning demons, is probably Cirque du Soleil or Circus of the Sun. Um, yeah. And they still put on these grand shows and um, you, know, you can decode all of their posters and all the artwork for these shows. And it's it's demonic to the core and all the symbolism I've shown on my um, channel is all there blatant for them to see, you know. 
if they're not really hiding their intentions if you have the eyes to see it so maybe that could be the last freemason stronghold ritualistic on a grand scale circus format that still exists in the modern day but in the right. past in this 1900s early 1900s late 1800s period um those circuses yeah they were a, a big deal to the initiated they were they were serious events you know um but to the uninitiated it was just a bit of fun for the family very clever and very clever. i never got into i never got into uh circuses i i, I don't know i just didn't like them no well i'm not surprised i mean i think we're all naturally averted to clowns you know I made these videos, you know, on my channel, basically trying to say, like, what were these people thinking in the past, thinking that they, these clowns were cute and fun and for children? They're absolutely terrifying, especially then, you know, the way people dressed like clowns back then, it was the most horrific thing you've ever seen. And it's kind of, you see all these black and white photos of children screaming their eyes and crying while this clown's holding them and laughing and staring in the face, you know, I, and all the parents and all the parents are they're like, oh, isn't it cute? You know, oh, isn't it fun? And it's kind of like, no, it's not fun. That child is having a severe panic attack and a traumatic experience. But it's like the people at the time were just utterly unaware of the psychological impact they were having on these children. You know, they just, just, I don't know if they were naive, evil, or just stupid. I don't know which one it was, but it was. It's just silly, you know. And yeah. So, so in terms of the Hat Man, we're not talking about the Hat Man here today. He plays a key role within the, the circus ritual and it has direct links and ties to Freemasonry at its core. Um, and if the Freemasons, you know, work with the demons, it can hardly be surprising that the highest ranking uh, person within the lodge would be the Hat Man. Basically a representation of a high ranking demon in the spiritual realm. So they mirror it, you know, and like I said, they just like ancestor worship cults do. The Freemasons in their own rituals dress like the thing to uh, evoke the thing and be possessed by the thing. So this Hatman character is is a is a big player, like I was saying earlier. Mm -hmm. Definitely a big player. There's always a Hatman in uh in the circuses too. Right? Yeah, that kind of reminds me of that uh, occult leader, um, Alistair Crawley. He's uh <laughs> yeah often many pictures with him wearing a hat, that top hat, all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we talk about magicians earlier as well. Magicians basically dress like a grandmaster of Freemasonry. That's the, that's the stereotypical magician's garb. You know, the waistcoat, the black uh, suit with the tail, with the, um, the tails at the back, the black top hat, you know, and like you said, they, the magicians, you know, the stereotype magician with the black and white wand with the top hat, pulling rabbits out of the hat, you know, and making flowers appear from the sleeves and the endless tissues and stuff which are kind of circus clownish acts to, to begin with, you know. Um, but it's kind of like a tongue-in-cheek reference to that Freemasons are basically wizards. That's what they are. The dark warlocks, you know, that's what they believe themselves to be. They believe that they have occult knowledge and power. You know, they, they are spellcasters, you know, and um, they, they are occultists. They work with the occult. They are quintessentially magicians, you know, and that's what... That's why the stereotypical magician's garb is basically a grand master of Freemasonry. It's the same costume, but it's kind of just, again, dumbed down for the kids. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's uh, occulted for the masses to not realize that that's what's going on. Uh, but that's the stereotype costume of your average magician in the past. You know, it's the, it's the one they put on the box of your magician's kit for kids. You know, it's, that's the image they put down, the caricature of a magician. But yeah, it's just basically just a worshipful master of Freemasonry. It's uh, yeah, it's 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 kind of it's in your face once you know. That's what I'd say. Absolutely, the Hat Man has been seen, like you're saying, all across the world. Yes, people see this entity, and, and I wonder, I wonder if they're associated with um uh, with the uh, UFO sightings. I, I I I'm trying to remember if, if I read some stories about that or not. I don't know. Not too sure. I've not heard anything about UFO sightings my, myself. Um, no, I mean, the, the only aspects I've looked into about... I'm not saying that it hasn't happened, by the way. Uh, I believe they're all dealing with the same entities, whether it's aliens, demons, or whatever, you know, or shadow people. It, it all comes under the same umbrella f for me. Um, you know, I come at it from a tautological perspective, an all-encompassing tautology, you know. Um, I'm kind of done trying to give it different names for the same thing. 
Um, I do believe it all comes under the same umbrella. So it wouldn't surprise me if within alien abduction stories, some kind of hatman like entity would appear. It really wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah, they're always... Um, there are different shapes and different sizes. Some say they're six foot tall. Some say they take up the space of the room, you know, as far as height goes, you know, eight foot, ten foot. Um, so they come in various sizes. Um, some say their eyes are, like you were saying, uh, you know, yellow. Some are red. Mm-hmm. And uh, all these freaky features that people, you know, um, explain what they what they have witnessed when, the, when they encountered the Hat Man. And uh, you know, I'm wondering if, other than psychedelics, DMT, and, and ayahuasca, I wonder if there's any family lineage that causes people to see these things, like you know, generational, um, you know, voodoo or shamanism or obviously Freemasonry. Well, yeah, okay, yeah. So on on voodoo, for example, you've already hit the nail on the head there. I've gone straight to the point with it. Um, so Haitian voodoo, for example, it's actually a, a strange mix. It's a relatively new religion. Um, it's believed that the Haitian people made a deal with the devil in order to kick out the the, the oppressors at the time, and it's basically a, a, a cursed people who live with the devil is what it's perceived as. Now, there's a there's a massive Christian culture now in in um, Haiti. Where this is prevalent and you know they all say the christians they're basically just demon worshippers the haitian voodoo people you know and they've they've corrupted our country basically um so they get so they take it very seriously the christians just as seriously as the occultist voodoos take their religion in haiti it's, it's a real it's actually a real spiritual war for them happening live you know what i mean um, and it's no joke to them that they have no two ways about it you know it's it's either you're with jesus or you're with the demons it's time and some people do prefer the demons over Jesus there quite powerfully, you know. Um, so the, the religion of the Haitian vo- is Vodou, it's called. It's a V-O-U-D-O-U. Voodoo is actually the more the New Orleans Americanized version. Okay. Um, but Vodou is the, is, the, is the core of the Haitian religion, where it comes from. Now, these people who were brought over here to this place are from actually the Yoruba tribes within, um, I think it's... Uh, northwestern africa um nigeria region but the yoruba people are uh, cover many countries within africa but they're like a they're like a particular um culture within africa the yoruba tribes and they have these these um ancestor spirit worship religions which kind of got brought over across to haiti in the americas region um but it also got mixed with obviously western freemasonry at the time uh, Catholicism as well, which was rich in the land and the people, the original people who owned that place. I think it was it the Spanish originally there in Haiti. I, 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 I think, think so. I forget. I don't know if it's the Portuguese or the Spanish, but either way, the um, conquistadors. The conquistadors, yeah, that's it. So obviously they had strong Catholic um, ties and religions there. They had uh, Freemasonry had its foothold in that region as well, along with these um, bizarre african cultures and tribes and it all kind of got amalgamated into one religion which we call vodou and uh, now the haitians who were left behind with this use freemasonic symbols like the square and the compass in their own sigils that they create for their own invocation rituals and lo and behold their main characters so they have a, a pantheon of gods they called iwas and the iwas um are basically like um they have their roots in the same gods from the Yoruba tribes, but they've been changed a little bit for the Haitian culture with the Catholicism and everything else. So, uh, for example, they, they follow St. John the Baptist as well. Um, but they've, they've kind of occulted him into this mythical character, which is associated with kind of like a psychopomp nature of guiding souls in the afterlife, this type of thing. Um, it's kind of like an occult witchcraft Catholic um African ancestor worship, Freemasonry all mashed together. It's a real messed up religion, okay? <laughs> right, but <laughs> I know, I know. Tongue twister. It really is, yeah. But um basically you'll find that they have these Iwas and um the main ones are um uh, Papa Legba and Baron Semedi. Now, these two characters, which are kind of like the main patriarchs of this spiritual ghost family they worship, um, they're matriarchal as well in the culture. They're quite strong with the matriarchs. They have their own female goddesses. But these two particular powerful male goddesses, which is like the father figure and his son, um, Baron Semedi 
is um, infamous for wearing a tall black top hat with a Freemason purple garb. He basically looks like the hat man that came to me in my dream. Um, and he also um, has a skeleton face. Um, he loves to drink rum and smoke cigars. And what you'll find these Haitian cultures do when they summon Baron Semedi is they will dress with a top hat and a suit and they will smoke cigars and drink rum. And it's an offering to him because that's what he enjoys having. And then they'll, they'll claim to be possessed by him and then black out and not remember the experience. And they'll basically be walking around smoking the cigar, drinking the rum. But it's this spirit that's now taken over them, basically. Enjoying the cigar and drinking the rum. <laughs> and the vessel, the person who summoned them, will have no recollection of it. And then they claim that they get gifts for this, you know, knowledge, power, and the ability to kill their enemies, that type of thing, spiritual power, you know, and whatever they want. So, you know, resolutions to family conflict. There's always promises. There's always something. There's always a carrot on the end of the string, you know, to keep people doing it. Um, but it's essentially no different than what the African cultures do when they wear their ritualistic ancestor garb to summon the, 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 the entity. It's so the entity can enjoy the pleasures of the flesh. And the, all they need is somebody stupid enough to summon them. And they'll come up with any image or way of getting the person to do that. But you'll find the hat man, inspired by the Freemasonic angle, is summoned regularly in this culture, in this tribe. So Papa Legba is another example. That's is, wild. Yeah, another another example is this, like I said, this Papa Legba. Um, I've got some information on him here, actually. So this is where Papa Legba is said to be like a caring patriarchal version in Vodou. Um, he's also um, there as a communicator between um, the big god and the people. He, he um, commun communicates on behalf of the dead and the living. Do you get what I mean? He's like a, a messenger of some kind. And this is based on Ishu or Elegba or Legba, which is in the Yoruba tribe's original African culture. So um, I've got a passage here online. So Legba is a trickster god of the Yoruba people of Nigeria and West Africa. He is unpredictable, sly, fond of pranks, and can be cruel and disruptive. Ishu, or Legba, who knows all the languages spoken on the earth, serves as a messenger between the gods and the people. He also carries up to heaven the sacrifices that people offer to the gods. According to one story, Ishu became a messenger after playing a trick on the high god. He stole potatoes or yams from the god's garden, used the god's slippers to make footprints there, and then suggested that the god had stolen the yams himself. Annoyed, the high god ordered Ishu to visit the sky every night and tell him what happened on earth during the day. So he's a mischievous trickster figure, and he appears in many forms. He's a shapeshifter. Um, and, he, and he appears, obviously, across many different people ac all across Africa. Um, and that's basically him. He enjoys confusion. Many stories tell of tricks he plays that cause arguments between friends or between husbands and wives. In one myth, he lured the sun and the moon into changing places to upset the cosmic order. He is the god of change, chance, uncertainty. Ishu is sometimes paired with Ifa a god representing order in the African Yoruba culture. And in one of these tales, it's saying, ha ha, you can't kill me, because if you kill me, you kill yourself. You can't have chaos without order. It's that type of thing. Um, so they have the whole dualistic black and white angle going on there, which is typical of the Nephilim religions when they existed. This sounds to me like this trickster god is a lesser Nephilim. The Nephilim were known to be basically people who communicated with the pantheons or the fallen angels on earth. They were the earthly foot soldiers of the heavenly watchers. Um, and this Ishu character, or Papa Legba, which has been incorporated into modern um, Vodou, Haitian Vodou, as well as this um, original African tribe, he sounds to me like he is a messenger between the gods and the people. So he is a bit above humans, but a little bit below the gods, small g. So that's basically the Nephilim, which are a little bit more than human, but below the angels who created them. It's the same thing, um, just with a different name, a different style. And um, actually, if you look and just type in Ishu into Google, um, I have some pictures here, but um, you can find these wooden carvings of this character. And he has a really long skull in all of them. 
and big mm. wide eyes and long serpent-like features on the face and they always um, depict him having an incredibly elongated skull so this uh, Papa Legba which has its roots all the way back to Africa you know is basically a Nephilim and those who dress it with like him and he dresses very similar to Baron Semedi as I mentioned earlier the top hat wearing suit wearing cigar smoking rum drinking skeleton man he, that's also how Papa Legba looks, very similar. So you dress like this Hatman character, you are channeling this ancient African Nephilim god of some kind who was just like his the the father. He's a trickster. He's just he's a liar. You know, he's he's um, irreverent, just like their parents, the fallen angels, the rebellious angels. You know, um, yeah. So that's that's the Vodou. Um, angle of the hat man and it, as you can see it has its roots all the way into ancestor worship of the nephilim it's no yeah, different there's images on on google and it's grotesque it's like an alien yeah <laughs> yeah, like yeah. they try and make out that these are just people you know what i mean um these are just ancient humans who existed that got so, so great in stature we made we made carvings of them but you look at them and it's like that's not a human <laughs> a lot of these uh, images, though, it has like four long, like spaghetti arms or like tentacles. Oh yeah, is that, what is that? Like, <laughs> I have no idea. But these things came in many shapes and forms, you know, and they were mixed with other animals. And you know, during that time when the nephilim were around, there was the mixing of kinds. You know, there was a mixing of animals with other animals, with humans with animals, all sorts of things going on. All flesh was becoming corrupt, you know. Um all taught how to be done by the fallen angels you know and and these nephilim their children and the potentates on the earth um so i wouldn't surprise me that these things just look wild in visage you know they're, they're not human and serpent-like features would have manifested on the nephilim absolutely inherited from the seraphim serpent-like parents um so you just see these old wooden carving depictions of this particular this one particular god in africa and you'll see yeah it's just just another nephilim just just another serpent man of some kind uh, yeah um, those things are really nasty i was reading a, a blog uh it's, it's a north atlantic blog on wordpress it says um uh, just a little snippet it says when hat man does appear the witness is usually sleeping in the early morning hours although users of the ouija board have also described encountering the hat man as well as alleged victims of alien abductions Oh, interesting. So that's, I mean, if these things are associated with, with alien abductions, I, you know what, I just think that, and this is just a hypothesis, I think these shadow people, these hat men, I think they're, they're the way I see it is some of these, some of these biologics, these, these entities people see, alien, they want to call them aliens, I think they're just host bodies that were created. And I think these Nephilim spirits indwelt them. And I think these shadow people maybe leave that body and come and, and you know, harass people or somehow they take a form of a hat man or, or you know, once again, a shadow person. And somehow, some way they're able to, I don't think it's, maybe physically they're taken to a craft or maybe their spirit is pulled out of them and taken to the craft. I don't know about that because I'm just kind of 50-50 on that because some people do exhibit implants and they have scars so that's my take and i i think that the nephilim spirits indwell some of these biologic they're in the insectoids or mm -hmm. the so-called elder race brothers um or these other entities i, I think they're all indwell spirits with the with the nephilim i think some of these these bodies are just they just you know for me in my opinion i think these bodies are created these so-called extraterrestrials that are probably terrestrial they probably always have been here on the earth they're just in another another reality of our earth that's the way i say i don't think they they're planetary species i'm leaning towards their terrestrial they've always been here mm -hmm. i've heard that theory a lot lately in, in the telegram group and from people who leave me comments about it it's it seems to the, the most popular train of thought is that these greys these these alien greys or whatever they are whatever the form they come in are just some kind of genetically engineered vessel of some kind mm -hmm. like a, like a sexless androgynous vessel that can't reproduce you know um, yeah, so. yeah and they're just basically there for the spirits to inhabit and it's a perfect place for them to be where the holy spirit can't dwell and kick them out you know uh, maybe maybe there's a limited supply of these vessels though so they have to kind of share <laughs> and uh 
Yeah, it, it, it probably, there's all sorts I could speculate about that idea, you know, and it does seem likely there's something like that going on. Because, uh, you know, people who have alien abduction stories, they, they claim they had a very physical experience. You know, it wasn't, they weren't just dreaming. They were being touched and felt by these things, you know, and moved around. And it wasn't just simply a, you know, maybe it was just a dream or I was just seeing things type of situation, you know. Um, I think I've heard someone theorizing as well that these vessels do feed by rubbing adrenochrome fueled cow's blood onto them or something like that which explains why they have all these mutilated cows from these abduction stories because they were mutilated to put them through pain to create the adrenochrome um i don't know about that but just just running with the idea and the topic you know i've heard all sorts about it and it's definitely uh, like you said we need to we need to pull on these threads um because extraterrestrials is not the answer you know no it's not and we need to consider that we need to answer though how how come people are seeing gray aliens <laughs> there's a reason but really? you know yeah. we do have to answer that question have a have a sufficient answer for them if it's demons you know and if they are a physical thing really flying around in some kind of craft then we need to consider that you know maybe they are a created being but not necessarily um the spirit that's within them mm -hmm. changes you know and depending on a, what's available there was a documentary by uh, a few years ago by justin fall and he mentioned that a group called the Collins Elite, a secret government group in the United States, did their research on UFOs and the so-called aliens, and they came back with their conclusion that they are demonic. Yeah. And um, some some feel that the U.S. government and other governments of the world have been working with these entities, especially since Eisenhower when he was in Palm Springs back in. I don't know, I want to say the 50s, he made an agreement with the Greys over technology. And then you get into the whole uh, people being abducted, women, their babies being taken. And you get that into, uh, you tie that into uh, um, Satanism where, where they actually um, do abortions as a sacrifice to Satan. And they have breeders that sacrifices and, you, and the reason why i say that is because you know these these babies are being taken from women by these so-called extraterrestrials how do we not know they're being sacrificed to to satan mm -hmm. and um you tie that all in with the hat man appearing allegedly according to the blog and i'm sure there's other blogs talking about people seeing the hat man along with you know alien abductions it, it makes you wonder um how this all ties into Freemasonry, uh, the Freemasons and and Satanism and UFOs and all this secret stuff, all this dark, dark secrets that you know are veiled over this world. Yeah, that the governments know about it because they have these crash things and and you know I, I heard one story that a guy went into a craft and a uh, military guy and it had strange writing on it and he didn't know what it was and a scientist told him. That's Enochian. He said, what do you mean? You know, he says, that's the language of the angels. It's the language of the demons, too. Yeah, it's yeah. also the language <laughs> of the demons. So, I mean, man, you know, this is, I mean, we're getting deeper into a rabbit hole here. You have the hat man, you have Satanism, you have the Freemasons. It's just, it, it, it keeps going. All these threads, the more you pull, the longer the thread gets. Yeah. Well, it was interesting you were saying there about, you know, um, the abortion angle, where the, when the they kill this baby it's actually a sacrifice to satan they're really doing you know and um i think you were mentioning there you know in these alien abduction stories where something similar might be happening you know where they're impregnating women then maybe taking the baby away this is hat man present and if you think about the hat man as i said symbolically in freemason being the leader or the orchestrator of the ritual and maybe the hat man needs to be present when this sacrifice happens in order to make it official in some way or to channel it in the correct way i don't know and then we're considering that the, the lead head shamans within Vodou culture, you know, who have the snake around their neck and they channel Baron Semedi, you know, this hat man, top hat wearing entity, uh, to orchestrate the ritual, the witch doctor ritual type of thing in Voodoo culture and Vodou culture. Now, it, let's bear that in mind and let's consider some other cultures that also have the hat man um, as the head shaman, okay? And the shamans, like I said, are the, the anointed leader 
of the spiritual process in which they channel the entity. Okay, that's what the whole purpose of a shaman is uh, within these cultures. So if we go to the Guahanas regions of um, the west coast of Canada, there's an archipelago of islands called Guahanas, um, Guahanas, I think it is, Guahanas, G-W-A-I-I-H-A-A-N-A-S. And this, yeah, this, 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 uh, this archipelago of islands is home to the, um, what are they called? There's an Indian tribe there, and they are also the Gwai something. <laughs> okay, the, I've got to say the, let's just say the tribes of the Guayanas region. We'll just say that for now. I can't remember off the top of my head the actual name, um, but it's something similar. And they basically have totem poles all over the place. Okay, and they have some amazing looking totem poles which stack these animals on top of each other with white skin, red lips, clown like features galore, you know, and these animal human hybrid like creatures all up and down these totem poles. Um, but they also have on the top of these totem poles human beings that wear these incredibly long, tall, striped, patterned top hats. And they're very yeah. tall hats, okay? And you'll find that the shaman in these tribes, um, they also wear a top hat while doing their invocation rituals to their ancestor spirits. And they twirl and twirl while doing wearing this hat. And they believe each segment of the hat that goes down in the stripes channels the entity closer and closer down towards their mind where they can then summon the ritual. And you hear these old uh, testimonies of people who witnessed the ritual claiming there's light coming out of the hat on each level as it comes down. You know, you get these these campfire stories about the true mystical nature of this dance, you know, and um, that's what it seems the hat was used for in that ritual. Particularly, it was a key tool used to channel an entity into the vessel from the ether kind of like an antenna in a way and um, so that that opens up the meaning towards why why a hat at all you know consider something like a wizard a quintessential witch or wizard and the hat you know they always wear this conical shaped floppy pointy wide rimmed hat in some way and i've heard people speculate that you know the cone shape of the hat is to direct the magical energy more directly into the skull or into the brain or into the mind you know, kind of like an antenna in some way, a, a a spiritual energy harvester of some kind. You know, so there is there is that one tribe, like I said, in, in um, the Americas, which has a, a very distinct type of top hat, which I thought was interesting and worth bringing up. Um, it's annoying me right now that I can't find the name off the top of my head. I'm going to have to Google it. Give me one second. Uh, Guay Hanas uh, tribe. Let's just see what it comes up with. The Haida Guay. That's what they're called. <laughs> okay. The Haida Gwai people. So type in Haida Gwai shaman, um, and it should just come up. Haida Gwai. But the sad thing is, they're, they're, they're dying out as a people. There's not many left of them now. They're getting quite westernized. Um, so I think what we would see this day and age, any images? Yeah, in McDonald's. Yeah, what we'd see this day and age are a lot more um, watered down from the original culture. Um yeah. But yeah, if it, unfortunately, nothing's coming up for, for Shaman. Let me have a look. I know they have some very old photos of the original people who visited them. Um, and they look like they're just wearing shawls right now. But um, there's one, I can see one here on a sculpted boat <laughs> wearing the top hat that I was mentioning. Um, so you can find examples of it. Uh, but the main examples of just how tall these hats actually were on the totem poles themselves, they've carved it within their artwork to memorialize these these ancient shamans type of thing um and yeah they're very weird looking things so there's there's that example but then if let's say we go to the other side of the world let's go all the way to korea now okay so we've crossed the pacific and we're now in korea okay different culture different history different land different peoples different language different everything okay not the same peoples um well they have a thing called a madang and that is their form of a shaman and these madangs are, they wear long flowing pink or blue coats of some kind, kind of their equivalent of a trench coat, like a, an Asian equivalent of a trench coat, you know. Um, and they also wear a very tall, wide brimmed, pink flower covered top hat. <laughs> they have feathers coming off it and all sorts of things. And these, these um, within the cultures, the madangs are outliers, okay. They get, they get hired. They're actually feared by the people in a way. You can't become a madang by choice. 
Ormadang's claim that they reluctantly got made to be one by the spirits. Because what usually happens is they experience some extreme trauma of some kind, which breaks them, <laughs> and they end up having like PTSD or something like that. Maybe they lose their husband in a, in a horrific event or something. The majority of them are women. I'll have to say that first of all. So, you know, some kind of tragic, horrible event happens in their life. And then the spirits come to them and tell them that they now need to be a channel. They need to be a madang. And that's what they end up giving everything up for and becoming. And now these madangs are hired by wealthy people and paid a lot of money to come to their homes to perform private rituals. And in these rituals, the madang or the shaman woman puts on this garb, does a very specific dance and process and humming and singing and music with very specific blood sacrifices of meat and money. A lot of things have to be sacrificed. And then this madang will end the ritual by being possessed by it, by the spirit. Okay. And it's expected that this happens at the end of the ritual. That's what the people are paying for. And then the person who paid the madang to do this asks the spirit for advice on something specific. Financial advice, family relationship advice, how to solve interpersonal quarrels and problems. Um, basically, it's like a human version of an Ouija board. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And, yeah. and that the madang, the shaman particularly, they dress like the hat man. Very specific costume. Um, you, can type, you can type it in. You know, just type in M-U-D-A-N-G Korea. And you'll see it straight away. Um, Mudang um, Korea. But yeah, these, like I said, these are are basically the same thing that happened, in, you know, in the North Americas or in Africa and anywhere that shamanism exists. They are the channel for the spirits. And, you know, people who don't, or don't know any better basically think they are talking to their ancestors. They think... Makes you wonder, you know, it makes you wonder how how old is, is the, the tall hat? I mean... When I think about antiquity, I don't think about tall hats, but who knows? Maybe in 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 the spiritual realm. Well, I don't. You know what, Paul? I don't even know if it's spiritual. I I think it's I think it's a physical realm because when you read the Bible that the angels came and they ate and they drank, you know why wouldn't these things be physical too? But somehow they're able to transition to our world and and. They can manifest themselves as as physical beings. So I, I don't know. It's just uh, there, there's a lot that we need to need to try to understand. Yeah, I'm looking at that image you you mentioned about the Madain in, in Korea. Yeah, I, I can see that. And it's funny because the imagery is all over the world. You know, the tall hat and these oh, yeah. encounters and worship and and so I, I don't know. I mean, the tall hat must be must be an ancient um, ancient symbol. Uh, going far beyond than what we think i believe so i believe i think it's far older than we're meant to believe um I, people always every time i talk about this someone in the chat or the comments always mentions that um if you're into the tartaria stuff it seems like the top hat was a huge fashion choice during this reset period they always say there were these men walking around in top hats with canes everywhere in these mud few, and they're covered cities type of thing there's pictures of all these top hat wearing people and these entities uh, so I don't I don't know about that myself, you know, but um, it might be worth just mentioning for posterity about that, so no one brings it up in the chat because <laughs> there's always somebody. Um, but the the idea that the top hat was a huge fashion choice at one point in in you know Victorian history makes you think as well, to be honest, because if this is a channeling thing, you know, whether you know it, that's what it is or not, but if it is a tool used to directly communicate with the spirit realm, what what would the effect of hundreds and thousands of people in a city wearing one have on the city and the culture you know um would these people be channeling them without even realizing it you know and then it was a highly spiritually charged time you know it's when things like seances were really popular you know and consorting with mystics and crystal balls and scrying mirrors and all that sort of thing was happening around the same time you know so just it's, it's like, like I said, wearing the costume of a clown. You might think you're having a bit of fun, but what you're really doing is put, putting on the skin of a Nephilim, you know, and you're allowing the spirits in. Whether you're aware of it or not, that's what's happening. Um, so, that, you know, all these people wearing top hats, what kind of effect did it have at, at the time? Just, yeah. Sorry, go, go ahead. I'm just speculating. No, I mean, because uh, you can have things, you can have a... Um... You know, it could be, you can have objects that can be 
that can be possessed with the with the spirit. And we talked about that with different uh, people who who are into that that realm, um, like Dr. Gallagher and and Danny Fergalti and uh, and Vicky jo- Vicky Joy Anderson. They they speak yeah. about how how certain objects that you hold can can be infused with evil. If it's like a a book on necromancing or you know anything that's talking about evil stuff, you know, or an, or a, a sculpture of a of an owl or or something, you know, uh, cocopelli or something, something that you know that represents the fallen world that it can be indwelt with with the spirit it can be charged. So maybe you're right, you know, these hats are like antennas. Maybe these 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 objects, these hats, are indwelt with the spirit that can communicate. Um, and you're you're going back in you know to history where you know, men back in those times, Victorian times, were, you know, thousands and thousands of people wearing these hats and maybe a lot of them were Masons and maybe they were, are, you know, acting like a, like a large antenna to the other world. Mm-hmm. Well, Masons, you know, are basically being trained to be shamans in a way, a very westernized version of one, you know, but right. basically what they're doing, you know, that's why they do these rituals and learn this knowledge is to commune with the spirit realm, you know, they're just, they're just posh, rich, glorified shamans, you know, a very westernized version of it. Like I said earlier, they considered themselves wizards, you know, uh, the grand worshipful master, you know, it sounds like a wizard to me, <laughs> just saying it, you know, they know what they're doing. Um, but yeah, yeah, like I said, whether you know what you're doing or not, I think you need to be careful about what you choose to wear. I think that's mainly the main takeaway from all my research at the end of the day, because I know a lot of people, like I said, they wear these things because they think it looks smart. You yeah, know, they were or they dress like a clown because they're trying to entertain the kids because they think it's what kids like, you know, they, I, I think a lot of naivety goes behind a lot of these things. Um, but it's it's unfortunate. It's, the, it's the, the way the law works. You know, ignorance of the law doesn't make you immune to the law, unfortunately. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, Freemasons ruled the world. Let's say, you know, that's an all encompassing thing. I know there's many, many subsections of secret societies and different orders and levels not just freemasonry but uh if they did have much influence and control over society it wouldn't surprise me if they would make the fashion choice of the time a particular highly charged spiritual tool you know um Mm -hmm. and i do believe that we're seeing the same thing today you know the fashion industry hasn't really changed in terms of a weapon um clothes today uh, come through the catwalks are ridiculous very clownish you know very outrageous and dehumanizing and what goes through the catwalks a diluted more relatively normal version eventually hits the high streets you know it's uh, downwind you know downstream of the high streets isn't it and you'll find right now that clown core is the in fashion um this moment you know the start of this year that was the clown core was running down people dressed like clowns was going down the highest end fashion runways you know um and yeah so it's, it's the same thing back in the day though the high-end fashion then was the top was the top hat you know and we already know that also has deep occult ties as well so it's 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 kind of the same game just with a slightly different veneer you know as time progresses the game changes with it type of thing um yeah, but it's it's fun to it's fun to think about. Absolutely terrifying yeah. as well. <laughs> After our first uh, podcast, now that I'm out in the streets, you know, I look around and I see, you know, I'm not putting anyone down, I'm not judging anyone. I'm just examining, observing, and I see some women with all oh, this makeup on their face, and I just, you know, I'm sorry, and Lord forgive me, but you know, I just like I say to myself, clown. <laughs> I mean, just I mean, overly done. It's just, you know, <sighs> yeah. I look at this and, and 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 you were you're right about you know the circuses today they're they're dying out however when you're mentioning about the catwalks and people dressing more like clowns and now the whole world is becoming a circus basically it's clown world now yeah since 2016 right it's been clown world the circus has externalized itself <laughs> no it's no longer in these little secret little meetings anymore um for the paying few it's now worldwide you know we are living in within the circus on the earth you know and i think the veil is getting thinner between the spiritual realm these things reside in our own world and i think we're seeing more and more manifestations of spiritually influenced people than ever before you know i call them the multicolored collective on my own work to try and hide from the algorithm and um, but we have this particular liberal leaning bent group of people 
you know, who uh, claim to be fighting for social justice. And, you know, you find that the flag is the multicolored rainbow and they dress like clowns, you know, and you have to wonder what the spirit behind this movement truly is when you see what they're actually wearing. Now, I don't think they're wearing that because they think it looks good. I think they're wearing it because the demon within them is trying to make themselves manifest physically through them. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's what we're truly seeing there. And it sounds ridiculous to say that to a secular-minded person and probably to those people as well. They wouldn't believe me, you know, but you have to test the spirits and you understand what these people fight for is purely evil when you actually think about it. Um, then the spirit within them has to be demonic in some nature and we will see manifestations of the spirit within them manifest physical through the host. That's just how it works. So what do they do? They dye their hair a crazy block colour. Uh, they dehumanise themselves. They mutilate their bodies. Um, they pierce themselves. They tattoo themselves. And they make themselves look as far away from human and more like a clown than you could really imagine. And that's the serpent within them. You know, that's the multicoloured, fractal, demonic, uh, jester clown demon within them <laughs> manifesting physically. I, I feel like you're describing this person that I've seen online. Well, I, there's, hundreds, there's hundreds of them, unfortunately. They're all kind of clones of each other. <laughs> no, no, but there's like this guy, very specifically, he literally has his face tattooed like a clown. and He claims to be a believer in Jesus, and he's just literally dressed up like a clown. He's out here in California. I don't know if you've ever heard of him or not. But... I think we touched on that. <laughs> I, have, I have heard of him. I'm very well aware of him. I've been watching him since his inception, before he blew up. Um, I I personally reached out to the man and he has not answered any my, any of my emails or got back in touch. I've told him all about my work, and um, you know I was as sincere and as honest and as open with him as I possibly could be. I've given him the benefit of the doubts if he is a genuine born again or not. Um, but so far I haven't seen anything substantial to make me think he isn't actually just some kind of in it for the money type of person or um hasn't tr has it all at the very least you know being generous maybe he just has a long way to go on his walk yet there's a lot of worldly things still yet he needs to let go of um and it's a long hard process you know coming to christ fully and and burning away the old self for the new um and he may have a lot of things yet he is still uh, clinging on to that he's afraid to let go of because who is he if he, he is not the clown barber of california he has those questions to ask. No, he has those real questions he needs to ask himself. Who am I? Who am I if I am not Richie the Barber? You know what I mean? Who am I if I am not the guy who dresses like a clown? He needs to... That it is his identity. It's, you know, and it's not going to be easy for him to just let that go. It, it yeah. isn't, you know. And the, you, you better believe that demons are not going to let it go either. <laughs> this guy's influence. You know, he's he's... He can be a very useful tool for the demons, you know, and the, unfortunately, the longer he holds on to that persona, he's still holding on to those demons, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. We were going to have him on our show, too, and, and I went back and forth with him. And uh, you want to tell a story? No, go ahead. And um, so, you know, I, I he said, wow, well, he says, you know, uh, um, he sent me a, a text message on Messenger. He says, I got to get paid. Just really blunt, not like, you know, hey, you know, brother, um, you know, can you help my ministry? You know, can you, you know, donate a little bit? No, I got to get paid. And he was on another podcast just, it, it was a few months ago. And um, I said, well, did they pay you? He says, I ain't arguing with you. And he basically just cut me off, says, yeah, I, and I don't want to be on your show. I'm like, wow. I mean, it was really rude. I'm just, I'm just summarizing it. And you also uh, mentioned that, um, you know, like a lot of other people who believe in Christ have came on our podcast who are no offense, a lot more popular and a lot, and a lot more knowledgeable than he is. And they didn't charge us one dollar for it because it's all about spreading the word and you know, spreading the gospel. And he just kind of laughed it off as yeah. like, we're a joke. You know, but yeah, I mentioned. Uh, I'm not the one that looks like a clown, you know, so. Yeah, uh, I mentioned um, specifically um, Dr. Richard Gallagher, clinical psychologist, uh, New York who's been doing this for 30, 35 years in demonic possession with, with the likes of uh, Father Malachi Martin and some other uh, Catholic uh, um, exorcists. And uh, this guy's a, a full-fledged, you know, uh, PhD, MD. And I mentioned him to um, this, this clown guy, and um, he just laughed it off, like, okay, this is just a big joke. 
So, I mean, coming from that point of view, all we can do is pray for the guy. But, you know, he does have a lot of work to do. And in my opinion, I think that um, he needs to let go of the worldly stuff, which is money. And if he's doing deliverances, I don't wholeheartedly believe that it's deliverance. Because um, if to do, to understand, speaking with these various people we've interviewed, these people who are really highly intelligent and really know what they're doing when it comes to deliverance or exorcist, if you're Catholic, that you have to be pure of heart to do this. And, and, and a man or a woman who are holding on to worldly things, by you can tell by their looks or what they have in their heart, how can a Nephilim deliver a person from a Nephilim? And the Bible also says, you know, people always say, you know, it's not about it's not about how I look, it's not about this, it's not about, you know, it's not about, you know, my clothing, how I dress, but it is because the Bible says, you you know, you show your loyalty by your fruits. And to me, you know, the fruits is, is also what's on the outside. Like, for example, if I meet someone on the street and they have, you know, they're dressed, you know, with a bunch of piercings and, you know, they're all wearing a bunch of satanic, you know, rock band shirts, you know, based off based off what I see without knowing you. I mean, I don't know you. To me, I would, the last thing I think you would believe is in God. The Bible says show your fruits, it doesn't say show your roots. So, you know, you also have to be different from the world. But And that, to me, that's by the way you dress, by the way you look. You, have to, you, you can't be part of this world. That's just, you know, what I get from the book. Yeah, well, in Richie's defense, he has tattooed himself. There's not much he can actually do to change that now. There's very little he can actually do about that. So yeah, he, he is going to have a very tough time to convince us otherwise. If that, yeah. you know, if that's how we're going to see it, I would like to, like I said, I would like to assume ignorance before malevolence here. I hope he is sincere, and he might at least believe he's doing the work of God. You know, I hope so. Um, and like I said, maybe it's just going to be a long process for him of less letting go of a lot of things, and it's a painful process. We've all had to go through it. You know, we've know, we've yeah. all had worldly addictions and things we've had to kind of fight. You know, and and through the grace of God and the help of Jesus, we've we've, we've beat it to the best we can you know I, I i still have an issue with caffeine i think that's probably my last thing i need to deal with you know but um you know i've i've, I've been there I, i've got tattoos myself you know I've, I've been a drug addict and all this type of thing so i'd i'd like not to judge as much as i can but um so far like i said i've, I've seen very i've seen very low effort to actually change um yeah. that's so far um i would oh. i would hope we can see more, but I have yet to see that personally. Um, and I don't imagine the, the thing is a lot of people follow him now. It's like you say, you know, he's casting out demons um, and he's talking, I watched one of his recent videos and he was talking about how a person just came to him when he was at his barber shop, shook his hand and then started crying and says, you know, I've got demons and all this type of thing. And he, he's saying how he cast them out of him. But then he was t saying, you know, he's casting demons out of people. Then, you know, sometimes they come back and they've got more demons. <laughs> and it's kind of like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> it sounds familiar from the Bible. I, I don't think you were really uh, doing it right then, you know. And maybe it is like it. Maybe I'm not saying somebody who's fired up for for the Lord may might be able to cast out a demon in the moment, you know, with enough faith and passion. I, I can believe that, you know. But yeah. uh, to maintain a demon free life, it requires fasting and prayer and a change, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I think you're you're right, you know, about letting the worldly things go. I don't think uh you know getting more piercings in your face and more tattoos and, and wearing leather with spikes on it is is you know, and a, and and a little purple top hat. Yeah. You know wow. with his wow. with his purple with his shining purple suit. Um and I don't think I know this is a, a personal choice in fashion, but I don't think Jesus wanted his name plastered in gold on the inside rim of a cap of a cap, you know. I don't think that's what he was aiming for when he wanted people to preach his name out to the nations type of thing. I don't think wearing a t shirt with some kind of image of him on it was necessarily the angle he was going for, you know. And this is the and the sensational nature of his work, you know, he does this podcast with his hype man there, going, Wow, you know, about everything he says. Um talking about the celebrity satanic worship and cults he's not actually saying anything new we've been saying this for, too. we've been saying this for decades you know but now suddenly a guy comes out who looks like a clown is saying it and everyone's all ears you know so there's something just slightly disingenuous about it that i can't quite put my finger on yeah no, it's also no you're getting to my point that guy whoever that guy is with the different color hair is always um questioning him 
he he doesn't take it serious either. Like I remember when I was listening to it and he was talking about one of these parties and he was, you know, saying there was a certain celebrity there, a female. And the the guy that I was going, wow, he kept saying, like, was she hot? Was she sexy? Did you wanna, you know, have sex with her? It's like, dude, like, why is that important? Like, that's not even funny. You know, you're you're claiming to have a Christian podcast and those are the questions you're asking. Yeah. Like, come on, man. They're trying to appeal to that wider audience comedy factor about it all. It's it's for money at the end of the day. You know, they're trying to create shock value, aren't they? And uh, this is what I mean. I, I would put him under the bracket of what I call conspiratainment. It's not really the truth. I won't call him a part of the truth movement. He is a part of the conspiratainment movement. He's there to entertain people with titillating stories. But those people, you know, will have a laugh and move on with their life and probably not think about it much afterwards. Um, and like I said, if he wants to get into the truth, then he would be talking to people like us, wouldn't he? Surely, you know, he would, he would be doing it for free. He would be talking to many people as he can. He'd be going from topic to topic, you know? Um, and from what I've recently gathered, you know, I think he's gone down the mainstream churchianity route in his faith. Um, he's now going to train to be a pastor, I believe (laughs) through pastor Joey, the person who's trained him, who is his pastor, you know, um, and you know a while ago in my research i was looking at like church um masses where everyone where everyone's dressed like a clown clown masses they were called in churches and it seemed like a ridiculous thing then but now we're literally going to have a clown being trained to be a pastor you know and it's normal and everyone's cheering it on and there's just something spiritually wrong about it especially from my own perspective my own research that side of it all it's and it's all come with the timing of this clown world situation we're in, where everything's now a, a mimetic joke layered under ten layers of irony, you know, and nothing, everything's irreverent and nothing's serious anymore, and everyone's ready to watch the world burn type of thing and laugh while it's happening, and it's kind of that's kind of it's like it's a symptom of the times, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, um, I there's something just spiritually poetic about about his whole existence and this timing. Um, and then if you want to get really conspiratorial about it, you know, just saying it outright, maybe he's a paid agent shill. <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe no, no, if you want to get really conspiratorial, I've no evidence for that claim whatsoever. You know, like I said, I'm more inclined to my first thing that he's probably has good intentions, but he has a lot to lose yet from the world before he's got there, truthfully. But maybe he is just a paid agent. No. You know, maybe, and uh, maybe not making that much money. <laughs> so, unfortunately, yeah, uh, I I think that just a, you know when I was following him when I was past tense, I uh, examined his videos of his deliverances, and some of them looked just you know like an act. It just looked like a play. Yeah, and, and I was in the Screen Actors Guild, and I took acting with Eric Morris one time, and all this stuff. So I know the nuances of doing this and some of the acting was really bad and um so i mean i i don't know i don't know i mean there's a lot of people following him and, and uh and that's it for me you know it's people out there you know that follow him just be careful be careful what you know what you hear not not just from him from anyone for me even even me talking right here you know uh, do your own research you know the, the bible read the bible what it says about casting out demons and listen to people like richard gallagher and Vicky Joy Anderson and, and Danny Fergalti and people who've actually, you know, who, who've been in this space of, of deliverance and know what it's all about or listen to David Carrico and John Pounders. Listen to people who know about this stuff, about SRA, satanic ritual abuse. And and see, we're talking about, you know, this this guy, you know, this clown guy. And um, it, it, it's all relevant to the hat man and, and the Nephilim because of the imagery, you know, like you mentioned the the hat, the top hat, mm-hmm. and, and and the colored clothes, and, and and you know, unfortunately, you know, with with you know, tattooing your body, the only way to remove that anywhere is, is with laser, and I don't know how effective that is, but that's that's always an option. Um, but hey, you know what? Um, that's his life. You know, it's unfortunate that you know people need to be more discernible when it comes to listening to anyone out there preaching even uh i'm i'm a little suspect i don't know how you feel about this um paul but i'm a little suspect about people putting a title of apostle before their name now these days 
I, don't, if I, I watch these people and a lot of it to me is like it's all prosperity gospel for me i look at it yeah a big bank a big money making scheme yeah well you see i'm not really a member of a church myself uh, particularly um i'm more of the you know where two or more people meet type of attitude when it comes to church and fellowship um yeah. i get my fellowship from the, my community I've built online. I have a Telegram group who are all pretty strong in our faith, you know, and we edify each other. Um, but when it came to coming to like churches, uh, it's never something I've really followed because I, I wasn't impressed, first of all, by the level of knowledge they actually had. Um, sure, they may have preached Jesus, but um, I don't feel like they were giving enough meat to really sustain a strong faith individual. Um, you know what I mean? And it's kind of, I needed more from what my local churches could offer me in that I respect know, um but in terms of like mega churches where you have these characters who are basically trying to just funnel as much money as they can from people and i think that's mainly an american thing you know not something i personally have had to deal with um but i've seen it you know is, is, is it it was his name is it is it joel something was he like a really famous one in your country joel uh, joel Olstein. Yeah. yeah supposedly he's stepping away to do something else now <laughs> he's made his money has he it is millions, man. <laughs> yeah. There you go. That's uh, what I mean. Uh, if you've got to be wary of anybody preaching the gospel, that'll make you rich. You know, yeah. um, prosperity gospel, I think it's called, and things like that. Um, that's not what it's about. You know, it's that's not. You know, your faith is to help pull you out from the sea, from drowning, really, and it's to keep you above water in this world. That's what it should be for. You know. <laughs> It's not to. It's not. It's not there as a as a snorkel to help you dive deeper into the world. Um, that's and it's kind of got to be. You know, like I said, money is is the root of all evil. Unfortunately, and you see a lot of that going around. Definitely. Um, uh, I was um I, I was a part of a church called Destiny, and I um you know I'm dropping we're dropping bombs today. You know I'll just I'll just say it because you know it, it's in my opinion. I have the right to my opinion. It's pretty bad. I went to this church and it was great. I mean, the lead pastor was great. It was, it was really, I, I really was enjoying it until it started getting to more about money. It started getting more about raising money. Mm. And oh, we, we raised this amount of money, but oh, we can't get that building because we used to pay other bills. But they're wearing thousands of dollars worth of clothes, you know, and shoes and jewelry and, mm. and crying and saying, oh, you know, God give up his only begotten son. What are you going to give to his church? You know, just, stuff like that it struck me it just struck me wrong and last time i went there is several years ago and i actually got nauseated and i left and i never went back and i ran to a few people who were going there and a lot of them have walked away from that place because now you know they see what it is it's it's just a 501c3 just making money mm -hmm. that's all it is. it's money making uh, um uh, organization. I don't even call it a church, and, and it's and it's not by itself for me. There's there's a lot of them out in this world that just they're all about money. You take that once again that Joel Olstein, in my opinion, and people get offended by me saying that. Well, then, oh, you know, oh well, you know, that's my opinion. If you really look at it, uh, there was a, an incident where where um, uh, evidently someone s stole money out of their uh, account in, in this church, and I think it was like six hundred thousand dollars, like for one day of services or two days of services. Do you imagine that? All that money they're making? Oh, yeah. And when that flood hit uh, Texas, that it, uh, he didn't want to let the people into his church and, you know, in, in the first go around. You charge them to come to church. Crazy. It's taking advantage of, of, of a Christian's good nature, isn't it, really? Um, I mean, someone's just pointed out in the chat here that I do have to correct myself. I said, no, it's it's money that's the root of all evil. Um, it's not. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. You know, money is just a, a useful tool to 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 get food and buy a home and live in the world. You know, but it's it's the the passion, desire to have more, that's the root of all evil. You know, um, all you need is enough. You know, there's that famous thing, isn't there? That study that says all the person really needs is about thirty thousand pounds a year, and they can live comfortably and happy. Any more money than that doesn't really make happiness go up in any way, shape, or form. It's from then on, it's just a pursuit of power. It's something else then. It's gone away from just having a happy, comfortable life, you know. Maybe that's an old statement because £30,000 isn't a lot of money these days. <laughs> but uh, I'm pretty sure about, you know, let's let's make that up to 50000 now then, let's say, for inflation, you know. <laughs> but uh, 
Um, like I said, the, the love of money is, is the issue. It's, I suppose, is what I need to correct myself saying there. So, uh, S. York, thanks for correcting me on that one in the chat there. <laughs> um, but like I said, it's, it's, it's taking advantage of people's good nature. And, you know, Christians want to support people. They want to give, you know. And I think it's kind of the problem with the world we live in is that people think money is the be-all and end-all of how to help somebody. It's kind of a part of our issue. You know, we realise it's... Um, it's not money necessarily an individual will need to make their life better. You know, you can give a homeless person a load of money, you know, and say, go sort your life out. But what if they just go and just spend it all on drugs? You know, it's, it's, they need saving is what they need. They don't need money. You know, <laughs> they need, they need a change of heart and they need to be free from the demons and addictions. It's more than just throwing money at the problem. But obviously our culture, especially Western culture, that's kind of how a, our understanding of what giving is. It's uh, money. You know, so it's again, it's preying on misunderstandings. It's preying on people's good nature. Um, in, in terms of like, um, we were talking about Richie the Barber earlier, you know, we were mentioning the Multicolored Collective. Um, I just want to bring it back to this whole idea about the clowns, you know. Um, Richie the Barber is, I wouldn't say he comes under the umbrella of um, the kind of Multicolored Collective I was talking about, but I do think he's definitely a symptom of the times. Um, like I said, because he's, there seems to be, let's say Christian characters or in the political sphere, right-wing characters appearing to counter this heavy left-leaning thing we've had dominating us for the past um, three to four years, you know, this uh, ultra Marxist, liberal, social Marxist attitude that's dominated the earth, you know. And uh, you'll find, you know, it all kind of ties in together. I said these people, you know, dress like clowns. And well, it's mainly this new age liberal left wing culture and ideology that also uh, purports the use of drugs and psychedelics, you know, to contact these entities. Um, and I was just obviously, I think it's probably um, pertinent for us to talk about the DMT realm and um, where these jesters are as well. You know, I think it's probably a good way to tie it in. So, yeah, yeah. The gestures. Absolutely. So, you know, um, I personally, I, I come from that new age Gnostic world. Um, like I said, I mentioned at the start of this stream, you know, I was, I was taking psychedelics regularly, experimenting with them, trying to understand just exactly what it was and what this, what this creation is type of thing. And I'm lucky that from the other side of it, I, I realized it means there's a, there's a God who created all of this. Um, I'm not saying do drugs to see God. I'm not saying you need to. I was just fortunate that that's what I took away from it. Most people don't. Most people start believing they are God as a result of taking these drugs, you know. Um, but uh, thank, thanks to my own research along the side and my study into the biblical perspective, it quickly taught me what was really going on. Um, I know I, I'll give a brief understanding of what I think this DMT realm is that everyone goes on about all the time in these cultures and these forums online, these trip reports. You know, they claim to see jesters there or entities that look like jesters there or machine elves or self-dribbling, shape-shifting forms of light in some way, you know, or these psychedelic, fractal, snake-like animals, insectoid beings, and all these entities here. In this ultra-psychedelic, colourful, fractal, patterned world of some kind. And the common interpretation I find in these forums is always something like, this is a projection of my own collective unconsciousness, reflecting back to me, mankind's um, archetypical symbols. So that was a bit of a mouthful, you know. So if I could simplify that, it's basically saying collectively mankind has one consciousness. We have all come up with symbols to represent things which we share as a common symbol. And when you go to the DMT realm, you're going to the realm of where all that consciousness connects and you're seeing all these symbols manifest in an attempt to teach you stuff to make you more enlightened. That's basically what they believe they're looking at. I would say it's far more simple and less egotistical and pretentious than that. I would say all you're looking at and all you're going to is this world that we experience in the physical. It's just the code of it. You're kind of going into the, the matrix underlying code that holds this world together. It's where all the information is stored that projects this world and creates this world and keeps this world in order. If you get what I mean, it's this world, just the other side. <laughs> okay. It's like a coin, you know, um, we're on one side of the coin. This world is the other side of the coin. One needs to exist for the other to exist. They, they have a job to do. It's the pipes 
it's the wiring, it's the code of this world. And that's where the entities that were disembodied now reside. When they died, they couldn't leave this world. Their soul, spirit, whatever it is, isn't compatible with heaven or anything beyond this world. They are truly terrestrial beings. You know, very extraterrestrial. You know, more terrestrial than we can imagine. Um, I, I think, though we are terrestrial beings, I think our soul and our spirits is destined for higher things in the end. You know, but theirs isn't. It's destined to be destroyed with this world. You know, that's that's what that's their fate at the end of the day. They're stuck here. Um, this is kind of what hell truly is, in my opinion. It's kind of you know where the where they're set to be. And I think they've done a good job at convincing us that that's where we're going to end up. And maybe some of us will, if we're not careful, you know. Um, I don't want to get into that theology now exactly, but this DMT realm that looks beautiful and amazing isn't mm -hmm. some, okay. isn't, is, yeah, it isn't some collective consciousness projection of some kind or some airy fairy psychedelic hippie nonsensical um, abstraction. It's a real place that exists all the time and is right here, right now. It is this world. <laughs> it's just the our vision is normally limited to perceive it for good reason i've been right. there and i would not like to see that world all the time if i did i would go insane i wouldn't be able to live if i was constantly perceiving the dmt realm i wouldn't be able to have a life i wouldn't be able to exist in the world and experience creation as God intended me to experience it as a human being. You know, you you were if you were constantly seeing that other realm, you would be seeing, well, first of all, Nephilim demon demonic spirits constant consistently. And that's not never a good thing. You know, <laughs> and they'll be they'll be able to communicate and mess with you so much <laughs> that you you would just drive yourself insane and probably end up killing yourself just to have a minute's peace. Um, but even if you didn't see the entities, it's too much. It's too much information for your brain to process all the time. So I believe God has limited our perceptions for good reason. Because this, this place where these fractal beings reside that look like jesters, as people describe them in numerous trip reports, you know, it's, it's not something to give into amazement about truly. It's not anything special. It's just where they happen to be right now. And I believe God has limited our perception for our own safety. There may have been a time where we could perceive it, you know, in the very beginning. Yeah. Um, there may have been a time. It's, it's not a, the, the place itself isn't bad. It's necessary. It's a part of the workings of this world, you know. Um, so I don't want to demonize the DMT realm exactly. Um, like I said, maybe it has its uses. It has a purpose. Sure. But right now it's a war zone and people who go there and smoke DMT and, and lift that veil for a second or 10 minutes or so. And they don't know this story, the history of why those things are there. They don't even know anything's there and they're open to be told anything and they'll believe it. Why wouldn't you listen to this creature telling you it's an alien? Why wouldn't you listen to this beautiful light being made of fractal psychedelic patterns when it tells you that it's an ascended master? who's going to teach you how to become a god, why wouldn't you believe it if you didn't know any better? It's, just, it's probably the, the first thing you've ever experienced that's close to a spiritual experience. You're going to listen to the thing if you've got no discernment, and it'll tell you anything. It'll tell you whatever you want to hear that it knows you personally will believe, whether that's ascended masters, Pallades from the, the I don't know the stars the seven sisters star system within the space um, I don't know interdimensional fifth dimensional beings uh, future selves come back to the past to help mankind advance uh, just simple simply aliens of some kind uh, angels is a common one you know ascended masters spirit guides they'll tell you anything as long as you will believe it whatever you will work for you and that's what you find people get told different things in different experiences. It's just like the alien abduction stories. They always get told a different story of where they come from and what they are. Right. That's, what, that's what liars do. <laughs> you know, they can't all be true. So it's a lie. It's all a lie as far as I'm concerned. And the one thing that they all react to, you know, may, they might not necessarily always flee like uh, people claim, but if you bring up Jesus, they might try and change the subject pretty quick. You know, they might dance around the point 
<laughs> they might put him down at first, but you be persistent about it and they will have a violent reaction. You know, they, they are not interested in you going down that path because as soon as you get the Holy Spirit in you, you're useless to them. You know, as far as they're concerned, we can't inhabit the body anymore. It's, you know, this, and they're a danger to us, you know, so they'll try to do anything they can. They'll lie to you and deceive to you to keep you coming back for as long as they can to strengthen that connection with them, to make that veil thinner. So they're no longer shadow entities, but they become the full form in the physical realm, you know. Any, any connection and tether to this realm they can strengthen, they will strengthen. And they'll lie to do it. And you see these forums, you know, these trip reports online and... <sighs> People are still so heavily deceived about what they're seeing because they're just craving some kind of spirituality because this world is so devoid of it right now that they're just, they're just, they'll, they'll believe anything. The first thing that they're told from, you know, a deceiving spirit, they'll believe it because they're just desperate for something because the materialistic, secularistic, atheistic worldview that they've been bar bombarded with for the past 20 to 30 years isn't enough to sustain the soul. So they'll take anything and it's not jesus or god that's being taught to them you know and it's what's encouraged by the culture is take the drugs talk to the beings you know that's that's what they're doing that's what the kids and the youth are going to first and they're giving into astonishment they're believing these spirits you know and no marvel you know for lucifer himself comes as an angel of light you know and that's what's happening here that's what this Good. is you know. That's what it is, man. I mean, you know, you got the new age and, and you got them going to these realms and seeing these different creatures and gestures. And you had a hat man story too, right? Oh, yeah. I had a psychedelic experience before. Uh, the first time I took mushrooms, it was the first and last time actually I took it. Um, I was helping a friend move and I remember I took it while we were loading up some stuff in the car. And as soon as I got in the car, it started to hit me. For some reason, I just had, just imagine you're driving the car, I'm driving the car, and I'm looking straight into the windshield. Everything looks fine, but like this image right in front of me, as clear as day, popped up of a, of a dark entity with a with a hat, with a kind of top hat, mm -hmm. kind of more like a like a detective hat versus the top hat, and it had a trench coat, and it was brown, it was brown, dark leather specifically and the eye it had no face it was just all black a black you know black face with white glowing eyes mm. and i was tripping me out and my friend that i was with um you know telling me what's wrong what's wrong and i finally snapped out of it i was like what do you mean what's wrong and they were like um you know you kept staring you kept staring forward i'm trying to ask you a question you weren't paying attention to me and they also had taken the shrooms too and i asked them did you see that <laughs> did you see what i just saw I was like, what are you talking about but anyways as I got home, or as I got to the place where I was uh, moving the stuff, um, I saw a bunch of like snakes in the walls, like a bunch of serpents, like just crawling through the walls. Just all I saw was snakes and a top hat man. And whenever I closed my eyes, I would see the snakes as with my eyes closed in neon colors, and it just terrified me. That does sound absolutely terrifying. That sounds crazy. You know, it's funny you say this was on mushrooms. When I did mushrooms as well, I had a very weird experience. It's unlike any other psychedelic mushrooms. Um, I can't. And the only way I can explain it is um, it's very earthy and thick and gloopy type of experience. Um, yeah. It's it's bubbly and gloopy and thick and the air you can you can you can taste the air in you know almost like you can pull it like putty type of thing. It's a very earthly deep rich experience type of thing um and i do think in that form you know, you see the most the most trippy things the darkest things the most earthly demons if you get what i mean because uh, dmt is very bright vivid clear crystalline you know what i mean because you're just looking at the the world you know what i mean just flipped quickly um but it does feel like mushrooms has this heady heavy intense body sleep paralysis style effect oh, yeah. you know what i mean and i think with that paralysis effect is when demons can really mess with you and put fear into you where you can't run away you can't control your limbs properly type of stuff um yeah so people need to be careful with that one definitely but that sounds like a terrifying experience absolutely it was everything demonic that i could possibly imagine yeah snakes in the wall i mean rainbow serpents in the wall exactly <laughs> like, yeah absolutely like you're twisted that's twisted. Uh, uh, it reminds me of uh, 
what's that Johnny Depp in Alice in Wonderland? That's kind of like it reminds me of that. A different color psychedelic. You're in Loathing in Las Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the old the lizard men at the bar. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, I used to love that film. I did. I used to really watch that film a lot at university during my psychedelic days. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one to watch. But I haven't watched it. I haven't watched it since then, and I don't think I'd enjoy it as much at this day and age. But you know, back back in the day when I wasn't really, uh, you know, that was one. And it was one of those films I was kind of like encouraged to like by all my friends around me. Like, you've got to watch this film. You know, it's it's great. It's a masterpiece. And I don't I don't think I would consider it one now. But uh, there's definitely an insight there into the reptilian aspect hinted within that film of the psychedelic experience. Definitely. Um. And they were all wearing posh suits, weren't they? Kind of like Freemasons as well, which I thought was interesting. Now that you say that, yep. Yeah. yeah, when I look back at that film, there's probably loads I could decode from it with new eyes. But I'm not going to waste my time watching that stuff anymore. So, <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely not. What that was a great, great, great. What we're coming up to now is almost two hours. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is there anything else um, we want to discuss? I mean, I'm, I'm game to go for a little bit longer, but it's up to you guys if you want to call it a night. Uh, um, tell us some more stuff. Tell us some more stories. Yeah, have you got any other <laughs> any other DMT trips that you know uh, you can remember? You mentioned in the we started off about that dream. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I, had, I think people, I think people would want to hear more what what you saw on DMT. Like like what was the landscape? What kind of creature did you see and stuff like that? See, I got lucky that I didn't see the creatures during the trip itself. It was afterwards for me. Um, after the experiences, I kind of opened up a gateway, if you get what I mean. But during the during the, the experiences, the I I did it I did DMT in two different settings, but I did it like twice in each setting, if you get what I mean. Um, at, at different times apart. So I suppose I've done it four times, but we'll call it two sessions, if you get what I mean. Um, and the first session, obviously, the first time you're a bundle of nerves, you're terrified of what's to come it's like before you go on a roller coaster and you don't know what to expect type of feeling um but i i you know took the three hits i held them in um and i pierced through and i ended up in a um very quickly the room kind of dissipated into itself it's like um everything was a suddenly a geometric formed pattern even the walls the, the wrinkles on the bedding in front of me everything about it was all perfectly meant to be type of feeling and it all kind of just became a mandala circular form within me but it the form was made up of the objects in front of me and the objects in front of me hadn't changed but my perception of it all had changed it's a very difficult thing to explain um so that was my first hint that i'm not actually leaving the room do you get what i mean it's more my right. perception of the room has changed that's what i realized my first thing about dmc i realized was that and then I pierced through this mandala thing, and then the room was gone. So it was still the room. I knew I was in the room, but I wasn't looking at it anymore. Instead, I was looking, I was within the center of a huge toroidal 3D realm form, and I was in the middle of it, radiating out of my head underneath me within. Um, and I was looking around this, this red and black pattern, psychedelic, ordained with gold, frills type, floral, geometric landscape type thing but it's like i was locked within like a world of sorts and i was watching it unfold in front of me and i was kind of there for 10 minutes while also in the room it's weird because i could interact with the people around me but i was also not there with them anymore it's a very weird sensation um and my friends who were next to me were saying he could see a woman dancing in the wall like mm. um and i couldn't see it personally <laughs> so i didn't have a shared experience necessarily um mm. But then it got to, when the trip got to its highest point, I, I couldn't communicate with anybody anymore. I was I was gone, uh, but I was I did feel like an intense like peace. I guess we'll call it um, ego death. I guess is the word people always described it as. Mm -hmm. um, I I no longer had a sense of self. You know, it was I was gone in that respect. Wow. Um, time was gone. Everything was gone, and I was kind of in the void. And the void was beautiful, but I no longer had um, any worries, doubts. I had, I didn't have a future. I didn't have a past. Uh, there was just this net one moment type of feeling, you know, and it was all in all, you know, if, if I'm being honest here, it was probably a pleasant experience. 
Do you know what I mean? And I came back, but I didn't get any spiritual insight from it. I didn't come away from that thinking I was God. You know, it was more of a, I think I've just seen through the creation a little bit and realized that it is a creation, you know? And yeah. I was strong enough by that point in knowledge, I think, to understand that I was looking for God, the real God, the Jesus God. I wasn't looking for demons or anything else. I was well aware of the jesters and the machine elves, you know, and what people claim to see, you know. So I was half expecting something to appear, but it didn't. Um, Because I was also aware of my uh, demon research by this point, I think, you know, um, I've been doing a lot of psychedelic mushroom exploration, MDMA, without that knowledge. But by this point, I was already prepared. I wasn't a Christian by this point, you know, but I was already researching the perspective. I was coming out of the new age slowly, you know, and I was never really a new age hippie type person. I never have been. Um, I've always been me as I'm talking to you now, kind of, you know. Um, I was never into the whole tarot card thing and crystal power and all that sort of stuff. That's never, I was more logistical about it. Like I wanted to kind of be scientific method to understanding these experiences type of attitude. You know, I really want to understand what this really is without trying to add too much artistic layering to my experience. You know, I'm just going to take the experience for what it actually was type of attitude and I came away my, from my first trip knowing for a fact it's a creation. I didn't make it. Something else has made this. And it's not as physical as I thought it was. I perceive it to be physical, sure. But there's also this other side to it, which is a spirit world. We'll call it. It has many names, you know. <laughs> but it's here right now in the room with me. And I suppose in a way I was blessed that no entity did come to me. Yeah, maybe sure. maybe no entity did appear because it already knew I was armed with the knowledge to defend myself if necessary. Now, I'm not saying I was a Christian, but in that moment, I probably would have called on Jesus if one did turn up. Do you get what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it's kind of, I was already at that point. Maybe it was too late for them to convince me of anything, so they just left it. Maybe the demon's attitude was, it's probably best not to appear. Maybe then he'll believe we don't exist. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Something like that. Um, I can only speculate on why nothing came to me. Um, so months passed after this, about six months, and I reunited with my old university friends again, and we did it again. This is um, when the periods I was doing this. So I'd already left university by this point. I was already going into my faith heavily, you know what I mean? And I wouldn't say I was fully given over to Christ by this point, but I was close, you know, but I was still dabbling a little bit in this realm. Uh, still smoked weed, you know what I mean? That type of thing. Um, so I did this again. And, you know, I was with people and I remember looking into the face as I took the hit of, of one of my close friends there. And I, I saw in his face kind of every nodal connection point of the design where all the dots and veins connected. It's weird. And he kind of, it's kind of like I was looking at the map of his design you know when you see like you know like when an NPC gets created in a computer program yeah. before all the details get added, it's like a mesh uh, that right. all the all the layers get added to. I mm -hmm. felt like I could see that energetic mesh within him. All the points of of his of his form were perfect, even though he was imperfect and no one's symmetrical and everything like. But he was perfect still, you know, in his own way. Um, it was a perfect. It's like it's almost as though I saw every follicle on his head. You know, I saw every freckle, I saw every, every crease, every line, every, every pore, you know, I saw the move, the blood run through his veins type of thing. I could, I could see it all as one image finally. And it was psychedelic, man. That's the only way I can describe it. <laughs> but that was another hint to me that we are created beings. We are designed, you know, it's crazy experience. I mean, yeah. And then would you, you see these, uh, like. You see, like blood vessels and hair you see that like in images or like no I, I meant like i could i could see through him in a way oh wow. um I, he was and i could see the skin was no longer just this this one thing you know you realize it's constantly changing color because of the blood flow through the vessels within the surface right. of the skin you know it's it's not Crazy. and it's kind of like normally you know like frames per second when you view something and um, we have a digital way of describing it, you know, I've, I feel like 
normally we see things at 60 frames per second. It's probably faster. But I felt like I was seeing everything at like 10,000 frames per second. So I noticed and processed more of the details of what was actually happening. And it's kind of like you realize, you know, that whole idea that particles are empty space, mm-hmm. you know, and everything is just vibration and frequency that holds it together. I felt yeah. like I could see that finally. That's crazy. Like it wasn't that, it, you know, I could finally realize that although he is in front of me physical, he is in constant flux and change in a sense, you know, he's a spiritual being still in a, having a physical, in a physical body, you know, he is the body and the spirit at the same time type of thing. It was a very weird, it's hard to explain, but I could just see it finally, you know, and I could see it in myself. I could look at my hands and I'd see the same thing, you know, um, constantly. It's kind of, there's so much happening at once in this world that it boggles the mind that it's all working. You you get what I mean? And it's kind of... I do. This isn't just something that happened by chance. This isn't a result of a chaotic explosion. (laughs) This is... All of it, it all became extremely apparent to me that, you know, we are created beings in a created world and there is a God. I could see it clearly. I had no pretext or delusion that I created any of it. I, I, I was embarrassed to imagine that maybe i did think that at one point you know <laughs> how um, how stupid and naive of me to think i created this you know i haven't got a clue what's going on like this is way beyond any human anything i could come up with you know it's it's and as as i did the whole progressing through the mandala thing again as the room became one with everything else and um, i could hear this this music playing it wasn't any music playing, but I could hear this beat, this rhythm. And it was kind of like a... With like a bass humming over it, like a... It was just going and going constantly. And it was like the world made that noise. You know what I mean? It, the whole world was vibrating this constant sound. And the walls were dancing like color but waves splashing into each other you know and i could see these these humans that i've known for years as these beautifully perfect creations around me these you know more magnificent than any creature i've ever seen in nature before type of thing and i just i just all i did for the rest of the trip was rock back and forth with my hands clasped together under my chin saying my god my god my god my god over and over again (laughs) in astonishment and um after that day i never did another drug ever again oh wow that's an experience well no psychedelic or hard drug ever again i didn't need to i'd seen enough you know um and then after that time you know over maybe a few years after i'd cold turkey quit cannabis um turkey? Wow. I switched to I actually documented the whole experience of quitting on YouTube, but I had to remove it all due to drug related stuff and copyright. Yeah, it got ridiculous. How was it? How was the first day? Because I'm trying to quit this stuff myself. It was uh okay, well I'd say the first three weeks are the are, are tough. The first uh, the first three days are bad. Okay. <laughs> What's hard for me is the sleeping thing. Is like you will not sleep for the first three days, okay? Be prepared for that. But once you get past that, you will sleep, but you will dream. And you will wake up a lot because of it, because those dreams are going to be incredibly intense. Because you haven't dreamt properly for as long as you've been smoking that stuff. And you'll remember just how psychedelic and real things can get in your dreams, and it will be oh so overwhelming, you will wake up in fear from what you're witnessing in your dreams. They'll be vivid and real. And then after that first week, you'll be suffering from like a depression because everything cannabis has been suppressing, the things you didn't want to think about, the things you smoke to forget, the problems you've ran away from and put to the wayside and not dealt with head on will all start to come back to your forefront of your memory. All the work you've been avoiding doing on yourself and within your life you will have to deal with. You can't just suppress it anymore with cannabis and move on and forget about it and live in the now anymore and forget about the future or the things you've done in the past. Everything will come back to haunt you. 
and you'll start to realize I have some work to do. I've got some people to talk to, you know, I've got some bridges I need to rebuild. Um, and that's upsetting and a horrifying thing to realize, you know, cause like, awful, but, but it's work that needs to be, it's work that needs to be done. Yeah. Um, but then that, after the, I would say phys the physical issues disappear after three weeks, then you're left with dealing with the mental things you've suppressed for all those years you'll have to deal with them now. You can't just run away from them anymore and smoke something and forget, you know. Um, and that's taken me a long time to fully reconcile, you know, myself. I think I quit cannabis seven years ago now. Um, I've quit cannabis, sorry, I, I've quit nicotine this year, at the start of the year. Um, I was on an electric cigarette for about five years. Um, I quit tobacco around the same time I quit cannabis, maybe just a little bit before. Um, but I've lowered the strength of the nicotine over those five, six years to the point of nothing. And this year, just after the new year, I put it in the bin and I haven't gone back since and I haven't needed any. Um, so I am finally, it's taken 10 years, nine years since I've been saved <laughs> to fully drop the major addictions I've had. It didn't happen. It didn't happen overnight, but I couldn't have done it without my faith. Yeah, the thing I've just been doing for so long, you know, and I cut back a lot. I used to smoke, um, if you know, if I'm pretty sure you know what wax is. Yeah, that's not the terminology we use here. Is it like a quarter, an eighth? Is it a... Oh, wax is like, um, it's like a concentrated form. It looks like... Oh, re resin. Burn it up. <laughs> resin. We call it resin here. Sorry. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. So I used to do that like every day, 10 times a day. Now I'm down to, now yeah. I'm down to just smoking flour now. And, um, and believe it or not, like I'm starting to get to the point now where without even telling myself, like just a process to, to break it up and pack it. And then, and I get paranoid now when I smoke, I used to get relaxed. Now I get paranoid. So I'm starting to see like, this is all resolving itself. Like I'm smoking less just by thinking about the process of packing it. And all of a sudden it's been giving me a paranoid thought versus a relaxing thought. It used to make me relax. Now it makes me paranoid. Yeah. Well, I think, I think, you know, learning about this type of stuff changes you anyway. I, I only quit because I wanted to. Up until that point, I didn't want to quit. But the more I learned, the more I realized I need to. And you have to want to do it before you can quit. You're not just going to quit for no reason, you know. Um, but it sounds like you want to. And I think it will come naturally. But obviously my advice is don't expect it to be instant. It's not, it's going to be, it'll be a long drawn out process, no doubt. Don't be afraid to go cold turkey. The worst parts are over after a week. Okay. And um, give yourself a period of time where you know you have some time off from work, I would say. You know, next time you have a holiday booked where you don't have any, you're not going away anywhere in particular, you've just got some time off work. That would be the ideal time for you to be able to work some stuff out on your own. You know, um, whether that's staying in bed all day, <laughs> nursing a headache, the headaches, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, um, and obviously, I don't know what it's like in your social life, but it's best not to surround yourself with people who still do it. No, absolutely. I agree. I've actually changed my own. Um, yeah. I changed the people who I've um, spent my time with very, you know, very dramatically over the past couple of years. And, um, yeah, because I've always believed in Jesus for the longest time since I was like, you know, since I can remember, but I've recently taken it serious and got baptized a couple of months ago. And I'm really trying to, even my pastor said the same thing, you know, all these things, you, you, you know, you have to stop doing are not going to happen overnight, but you need, you know, but over time, if you believe in Christ and you, you follow the steps, you're going to be sanctified over time. Yeah. And, and it's been working, you know, uh, things are happening little by little. I mean, I used to be a very impatient person. I still am. I have anger issues, but um, they've actually calmed down a lot and I've pulled back from a lot of different things, but um, yeah. I mean, I know, I know, I know we understand that our, our ultimate role model is Jesus at the end of the day. Um, but no one's going to ever reach perfection like him. Okay. So compare yourself to who you were yesterday is the best advice I can give in that respect. Um, you know, every day you remain sober is a step forward. Um, and the problem is with, this is advice for other people out there who might be listening who are struggling with the same thing. The problem is when you, you know, you have all these friends who are heavily seeped in this pro cannabis culture and it is a culture, you know, it's a, uh, they back each other up, don't they? And it's like a, it's like a feedback loop of supporting smoking cannabis that kind of happens when you quit, your friends aren't going to be supportive of you. Okay. Cause you quitting 
is throwing shade on them in their eyes. Okay, you saying I'm going to quit this stuff is they all they hear is you're judging me for not quitting. Do you get what I mean? And they and they won't they, they won't support you. This. Yeah, yeah, I think cannabis is the only drug that people always try to um, defend by saying, "Oh, it's natural; it grows." It, you know, it's not really a drug, but it, it absolutely is. You know, yeah. Speaking from experience, I, I need to smoke it every night to go to sleep. I was, I was that, I was that. My choice is by wanting. Absolutely no, I was the same. You know, I was smoking about four, maybe eight joints a day at its height. You know, for eight, for eight years straight, like from morning till till night time. You know, all I would work to to buy it, and I would everything I, I would just wait to get back home and spark up a joint basically that's all my live for you know yeah, that's, the best, that's the best part of the day you work all day and just waiting to get home but the thing is all my money went on it so i was working to buy it to go home and smoke it then going back to work and it's kind of this endless cycle and you know the biggest the biggest thing i will say is quitting you will set, very quickly see the amount of money you have okay and that will be your first incentive to carry on i would say um because the shock of how much money I spent on that once you once I actually put it in perspective after I quit was ridiculous. It's it's ridiculously expensive in England it is especially. I'm, it might be cheaper there for you in America. I'm not sure. California is pretty cheap. But, yeah, but it's it's not that cheap. It's it's uh, it's about another car payment a month. That's what I mean. No, it's 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 no joke when the money comes when it comes down to it. You know that that's money that can be best spent elsewhere. You know, on more productive, useful things for your life. Um, it's a waste of time and your life smoking. Cannabis. You'll realize how many years you've wasted, you know, once you've, you're free from it type of thing. Um, it keeps you locked in such a weird mindset of, of constantly being in the now, like I tried to explain earlier. And it's hard, you know, I feel like I've I've lost a lot of time because of it. I've lost eight years of my life, you know. Yeah, um, but it. I've wasted so much time. Uh, there's a lot of things I could have gotten done, but you know, you just want to get high. I mean, it's it's it was to the when I first started smoking, I was probably a late teen, and I noticed that I spent a lot of nights wasting my time sitting in the back seat of a car mm -hmm. outside of my house or, or outside of my friend's house, just smoking weed and listening to music and just breaking down the lyrics of a ridiculous song that means absolutely nothing for my fate and my and my personal you know immortality. Absolutely, yeah. I, I mean, I I, I was. Look, well, I say lucky enough, but um, I could smoke in my own home. I had quite liberal parents in that respect. I, um, I had a, a stone, a brick shed in the garden, which kind of made my own space. Um, and I had friends over. I, was, I had a band. You know, I made music. We made music together. It was all kind of just one thing, you know. Um, and I, my place was the place to go. And so it kind of created a strong feedback loop culture for me, which was difficult to break because I've been letting other people down, you know, it was in, but I let all that go eventually. And, you know, I'd I say since I've obviously been born again and changed my worldview and my, the things I do, I've left people by the wayside who haven't changed, you know, um, and they've kind of abandoned me as well in that respect. Um, because maybe whenever we truly were friends, it was always just about the drugs. You know, exactly. and yeah, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, just, I mean they're, they're in their late thirties and they're still bragging about smoke. Oh man, I'm getting high right now. I'm about to get high, about to do this, about to buy this super magnum joint with <laughs> 10 joints in one that's dipped in oil and dipped in this and, and that you're cool. You know, like, you know, who, you know, what kind of immature mindset would like, yeah, man, let me join you, bro. Like they literally post stuff on Instagram you know about to spark a joint who wants to come meet up with me in the parking lot bro you're 40 you sound like a pervert or a weirdo <laughs> <laughs> well yeah so yeah but it becomes it's it's an identity issue um you know, we're talking about earlier on we talk about richard the barber weren't we who is richard the barber without the clown outfit and being the persona well it, a lot of people who suffer from the addiction of cannabis it's the same thing who am i without cannabis you know my my entire persona is built around being the guy who smokes all this weed and people, you know, see me as that type of thing. And I, I don't, and some people aren't ready to let that go. It's the character is who they are, you know. And what I would say is, you know, who God truly intended you to be will become clear once you quit, you know, and you'll realize he had a much better plan for you than that. <laughs> and and I, the thing is, I empathize with people who smoke it. Um, you know, it's a good way to bury the trauma. It really is. Um, 
and I, I really, I really, I don't put anyone down who does it. I get it. And in my own way, I was running from my own traumas, you know, uh, deaths and traumatic events in the family and things like that. Heartbreak, you know, and abandonment stuff. And you kind of, you use it as a crutch to forget, you know, and I get it. I empathize with it. And, and uh, you find most addictions. I think there's, um, there's a psychiatrist called Gabe Mate, I think his name is. Yeah. And he basically has this whole thing about, you know, people aren't really addicted to drugs. They're just hiding from some a traumatic event. Oh, yeah. And all you have to do is confront the traumatic events and deal with that and the addiction will drop. And, you know, he's found through his studies that that's what it's really about at the end of the day. Um, happy with yourself to, to realize that that's a really hard. Thing yeah. You know, yeah. That now day and age. We're all, we're all, who hasn't lived in this world and experienced trauma in some way, you know, and we're the most drugged up generation ever. Yeah. Um, and, but, you know, I, I cast no judgment on people who, who have addictions. Um, we, everyone's addicted to something. Absolutely. You know, um, I do believe how cannabis is, like you said, I mean, it's, it's definitely like a, there's a difference between someone who gets high all day and, you know, they, they live, you know, I'm just being stereotypical, you know, in America, you know, someone who gets high all day, who's way old, who's way too old to be living with their parents. Mm -hmm. who just gets high and they only work just to buy weed and play video games or watch TV or masturbate, whatever it is they do all day. And there's a person who smokes, who has, you know, actual pain, who has actual, um, you know, hard time sleeping. And they only do it for that reason versus, you know, taking a bunch of uh, NyQuil or whatever the case may be. Not saying that that person, you know, that's taking it for this is, is in any kind of right. But there are, there are medical facts, you know, that, that cannabis. I agree whatever cbd does some kind of helping but there's also the person yeah. that I said that just smokes all day and, and they overextend themselves in their low budget of money just to get high so, it's a I think there's a difference between using something and abusing something you know i do think like i said there are great medical advantages for cannabis and when uses the tool in a correct way for people uh, like i said people with um is it parkinson's the one with the shake is yes that, yeah yeah that it's it, it, it helps with that dramatically you know and it gives people a better quality of life and you know and at the end of the day these 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 plants and herbs are god's creation you know i'm not going to get try and get too hippie about it but there's, there's probably a legitimate use for these which may, may have been intended you know but smoking eight joints a day is not how god was intending this to be used you know <laughs> um, and running away from your emotional issues is not what it was supposed to be used for you know um so i'm all for it being you know used in a correct way that helps better people's lives in some way you know it's not like i'm i'm a zealot about this you know like i said like i said i empathize with people i've been there you know i, I get it you know and this, this is not something you should be judgmental about you know we're all damaged we're all addicted to something we all have a battle a demon we're battling or have battled with or you know we're all at different levels of basically coming back to, to god you know and your struggle is cannabis as was mine and many other things i'm sure you know that's that's that is how it is and i'm uh, it's all trauma based i do think it comes down to trauma at the end of the day i think we all we all need something to just have a moment's peace you know, yeah, so to, yeah. to, to forget I talk to you i'm gonna brag about how i've been smoking less because <laughs> as I, as you were just saying i got i can't say nothing against it because i just submitted it right here on live that I, I still do it but i am cutting back and i mean i used to be that guy that I used to have, you know, I got the, like the purple, I got the sativa, I got the indica, I got the blue dream, I got all of it, bro, and I got the edible, and I got the wax. I used to be that guy who just needed to get high to, I need to get high to watch a movie, I need to get high to play a video game, I need to get high to drive my car, I need to get high to, to listen to music, and at that point, you're just, ups, you're just, you know, a pure addict. I'm no longer like that, but there is, you know, there is, you know, I have a lot of time to still get off of this stuff, but I don't think I, don't think I can do a cold turkey like you did. But I'm slowly getting. Oh, I'm sure you could. I'm sure you could. <laughs> you just need a strong enough reason. You know, yeah. find your reason is what I'll say, and I think you could do it. I mean, I, I, my reason was I realized I wasn't in control anymore. Um, you know, I, like I said, I smoked eight joints a day. I had to. I had to smoke to feel normal. I didn't get high anymore. I felt normal when I smoked. That's when I knew this is not me anymore. I'm not in control anymore. 
you know, um, I don't smoke to get high. I smoke just to feel normal. And that realization, you know, shook me to the core, basically. It's kind of like, who am I? I'm not in control. I'm not, I'm literally not controlling myself here. You know, something else is in control. Um, and I, I was, I was not having it anymore. You know, it's kind of, no, I'm taking back control of my life. It's kind of how I thought about it. And I just did it. Um, and it was scary. It's like taking a bungee jump, you know, it's like jumping out of a plane, not knowing whether or not the parachute's going to work. Um, it's a leap of faith at the end of the day. Um, I would say, just take it and it will, you will be fine. You will be okay. The first seven days are the worst. The first three days are the worst, but seven days is rough. Um, by three weeks, you're out of the body problems, the body withdrawal symptoms. And then you'll just have to deal with the psychological issues that you've been ignoring. That's extent to uh, reach out to you so you can have my back and help me get through it. <laughs> <laughs> You've got my uh, Facebook. Yeah, absolutely. Just reach out to him whenever you want. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate that, though. No, no. All your advice and everything you've been through, I really appreciate that because I'm dead serious about quitting eventually soon. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I, no, good luck. Good luck. That's all I can say. Good luck to you, honestly. I think it was, it was good talking about that. Uh, the, the Hat Man, DMT, and, and also uh, addictions. I think it's good for people to hear that. Some out there need to hear it. Um, yeah, well, it's, all I, it's all connected at the end of the day. Um, we're talking about spiritual stuff here. I mean, we haven't really mentioned the clowns much in this talk, but it, if people listen to our last previous talk, I cover it in depth there. Um, I suppose the Hatman topic is kind of like an extracurricular topic for the okay. clowns. Um, mm -hmm. But what it inevitably leads into is spiritual experiences, which people crave and look, search for through mm -hmm. mediums like drugs and unfortunately drugs are an addictive thing you know and i suppose talking about addiction at the end is probably a good way to uh, kind of summarize the whole talk i agree exactly it was it was a great talk um me personally i, I don't you know smoke um cannabis or but, but i do smoke cigars too many cigars yeah two two cigars a day trying to quit so we all have our little a little addictions, you know, whatever it is, people out there, uh, you know, if it's too much coffee or, you know, too much cigarettes or, or too much candy bars, it, everyone's got something going on in their lives. And, and no, you know, we're not perfect, but we're trying to get there. And, um, but hey, it was great, you know, discussing this, this, um, this uh, episode was really great. Uh, the Hat Man, the DMT, your experiences. Your experiences, line experiences with cannabis and all that stuff, all it ties into the spiritual world and your spiritual well-being. Mm -hmm. I was awesome. This show was really, really great. Hit on a bunch of points on on today's world and and what people see and the new age and taking DMT and other psychedelics and opening up the third eye and seeing all these weird things and just I mean it, it was just a lot. This show had a lot, a lot, a lot into it. But we loved having you on. It was great. Paul. Yeah, I do it again, buddy. It's been a pleasure. Invite me back anytime. I'm sure I can find a slot for you guys. Um, I'm looking to have uh, another talk with Vicky Joy Anderson, actually, myself. Um, I think you guys introduced me to her, so thanks for that as well. Um, oh, yeah, she's really a treat, man. She's a very smart woman. She is, yeah. I think she's been away on a conference the past 10 days, but I'm going to get back in touch with her soon and see if I can get a talk with her. It'd be, it'd be, cool, oh, if it, it'd be cool if we could all get together, you know? <laughs> yeah. About, getting together. Yeah, it might be cool if maybe we could all get together and have kind of like a round table talk. I'm all game. Oh, we've done that. that before. We do it again. Definitely, she would definitely do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm. I don't know if Gary Wayne will be up for that, but I've I've, I've arranged to talk with Gary, Gary on the 11th of October. He might. He might come on. Just we got to find a topic for for Gary Wayne and Vicky Joy and get them all on. Hey, if you <laughs> get Vicky Joy and Gary Wayne on the same podcast, you're not going to get one word in. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah, fair warning. <laughs> no, I know. I, I've talked to Gary before on my channel, and um, I, like I said, I ho I'm, I've arranged to talk with him again on the uh, in October, so I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, but yeah, we see. I seems since I've come back to YouTube, I'm starting to network with a lot of podcasters and you know people of similar minds like you guys, and obviously Vicky and stuff like that. Um, Mark from um, My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast as well um and you know it's, it's nice to be back into this community again you know it's quite a strong one it seems a lot more tightly knit than it used to be um i think a lot more people these days in the conspiracy world and this train of thought type world are, are 
it's kind of the knowledge is kind of settled now. There's less arguments about it. We kind of all figured it out, you know. Um, so facts down, you know. Yeah, so I mean, we know we know a thing or two now. Yeah, there's less arguing about what the situation is. We're all kind of blatantly aware of it now. <laughs> Uh, but no, it's been great to connect with you guys. It really has. Um, and I look forward to doing it again. God bless. Thank you. Yeah, you can find uh, Seventh at Midnight podcast on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, um, Sabbath at Midnight, just like that. You know, don't forget to, you know, like, share, subscribe, and also follow. Follow All Paul. stars right here yeah. on YouTube is Understanding Conspiracy. One word, Understanding Conspiracy. That's right. And, yeah, God bless. Uh, go ahead, actually, Paul, go ahead and uh, get more information out. Do you have any other websites that you got? Uh, no, it's all on YouTube for me. Um, I have my channel. You can email me at understandingconspiracy at gmail.com um, if you have any information you want to share with me or you just want to connect. Um, I have a patron, which you can go to just by searching under Understanding Conspiracy. And I do an extra video every week um, for patrons only on there and share extra things like uh, snippets of my book. Um, I am writing a book on this whole Nephilim clown situation. Um, I am 13 chapters in, so I'm a third of the way. I'm getting there. Um, uh, there's a GoFundMe to support that if you want to. Um, you can find the links on my channel to get to that as well. Um, but obviously, like, hopefully the book should be ready by the end of the year. And that should be, well, maybe not the end of the year, but roughly halfway through next year, I'm hoping it should be published by that point and proofread and everything, all the legal stuff done and dusted, you know, and um second draft stuff all sorted so that's to look forward to on my channel but if you want to just join in with the conversation go to youtube understanding conspiracy or you can find me on telegram now as well i have a nice big group chat there and where you can get in touch with me straight away and um, we have a nice little community on there we have a great back and forth um, it's good fun we share information on there regularly uh, so telegram and youtube yeah awesome Thank you once again for coming on Seventh and Midnight podcast from somewhere in the low desert, not too far from Area Fifty One. Yeah, hey, really quick, just stay on the line, and we're gonna close out right here, and then we'll chat a little bit if that's okay with you, sir. Sure thing. We're off.